So welcome to Craft Skills for Garden Conservation. This is our third webinar. So my name is Kate Nicholl. I'm the workshop coordinator for this fairly new uh, garden training scheme. We've been going uh, planning all through COVID uh, and now we're just getting to the end of the webinar, winter webinar stage uh, and about to go into the summer workshops. So what's it all about? It's really a recognition that uh, particularly during this period of COVID uh, that we're just coming out of, that heritage gardens have played a really important part in our uh, endurance of this time. Um, it's that whole story of our natural and cultural capital um, being so therapeutic for people who have been locked down or suffered all sorts of problems over the last couple of years. And it's part of a much bigger story, we all know, but any gardens with any um, pretensions of historic importance do require a huge amount of knowledge and skills and they're in increasingly short supply. So we got together a group of uh, European uh, trainers and uh, gardens um, to see what we could do about it. And we've come up with this um, scheme, which has been funded by the Erasmus Plus program. We are six partners uh, from four countries at the moment. And these are the six partners. Um, I, as you can probably tell, come from the UK uh, and we have plant network representing a whole host of gardens in uh, the UK, but we also have a much broader spectrum coming from the European Garden Heritage Network and Norway is hosting the whole scheme out of the marvellous Vea College um, and we have Swedish partners and German gardens as well. So um, it's, the project lasts for three years. And over those three years, we have several different activities, nine webinars. So this is number three, as I said, out of nine. And they run in the winter months because I, as a practical hands-on gardener, know very well that you do not want to be sitting indoors as once the weather is good enough to start gardening. And I have to say today is rather a sunny day here in the UK, very cold, um, but we are coming into the spring, certainly. I don't know about everyone else in the rest of Scandinavia and uh, Europe. So as well as the nine webinars, we've got nine practical workshops. Um, so the first of them is coming up in May, uh, and that is the soil management workshop, which is going to be hosted by Norway. And you'll be pleased to hear that the website now has a button to press where you can express your interest and start the application process. Uh, it also has the full program, uh, which I will just reveal to you here. Very hard for you to take that in on the screen. But if you go to our website, uh, which is gardenconservation.eu, you'll see all those different webinars and practical workshops. And as well, you'll see recordings of the webinars that we've finished already, the first two, which were in February. And then this one, if you have colleagues who can't join today, then do tell them that in a week or so, um, the recording of this webinar will be available on uh, the website. So um, we're getting towards actually starting and more and more people are joining, which is great to see. Uh, we will be putting up uh, in the chat a method for you to show where you're from and what you do in terms of your job role. Um, and that will uh, be ongoing. It's just a little survey which we'll share at some stage. Rebecca will share that with us. Um, but generally on communication during the webinar, that chat line, which is beginning to um, fill up, I can see, um, is for you communicating between you uh, and with us as well. But the question and answer session uh, button is specifically for questions for the speakers, because as you'll see from the programme, which hopefully you received with your email and is also in the chat, um, we're having Q&A sessions 
uh, at certain points during the programme, and I will read out those questions um, to our speakers who will then answer them and hopefully a discussion will ensue. So we won't be hearing your voices until the very end section of the day. So it will be written questions. Um, and if you do struggle with English uh, for writing your questions, I'm sure we've got enough people on the panel who can translate uh, your questions uh, for me, because sadly I don't speak uh, many other languages apart from French. Um, so there we go. During the lunch break, which you'll see is quite a nice, generous, long lunch break, in case like me, you do need a good break from the screen and get outside and have some lunch, We'll also be conducting a poll uh, very specifically about this subject of trained fruit. Um, so that's something we're just going to be asking you some questions to gather some information about what we all have in our gardens in terms of trained fruit. Um, and there'll be a survey at the end to find out what you think of the whole um, scheme so far or this particular workshop. So that leads me actually into the topic today. Um, so uh, we are um, going to start um, sharing um, Susan's screen in a minute, uh, but I just wanted to introduce Susan Campbell. So if any of you um, are keen kitchen gardeners and specifically come from the UK, I'm sure you will know Susan. Uh, she has been a great heroine of mine uh, since her first book. Um, and I've been following her um, walled kitchen garden network, which she set up a few years ago, um, since I started my walled garden restoration. And that first slide that you've just seen come up is what faced me when I arrived at Attingham Kitchen Garden in 2009. And that is what train fruit isn't. That is 400 meters of brick wall with no fruit on it at all. Um, and it just really came home to me how if you have a walled garden without any wall fruit, you're talking about a house without windows and certainly a house without pictures on the wall. The wall becomes a barrier, not a marvelous resource, which hopefully today's speakers will really tell you how you can exploit those amazing resources. So thankfully, there was the likes of Susan Campbell there to help me. And this, I think uh, she can correct me if I'm wrong, is her first book um, on wall kitchen gardens, which came out in 1983. Um, and has a wonderful picture of, I suspect it's a trained peach or apricot. I'm not quite sure from the foliage, but uh, it looks a beautiful tree. And that was a huge inspiration to me to start getting those peaches and apricots and nectarines back on to that south facing wall, which we did thankfully quite quickly. Um, and just to show you that um, Susan isn't, um, isn't just, but she's as well as a brilliant historian, researcher, writer, she's a fantastic illustrator. And I wanted to share with you this lovely image that she created as part of one of her books, but also as a wall print. And that sits behind me on my office wall and shows, um, even though it's her own image, some of the inspiring images that you can find in historic documents, which I think she is about to share with us. So Susan, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, we'll need you to unmute and to share your screen if that's okay. And while you're doing that, um, I will just mention something that's coming up with the Walls Kitchen Garden Network in that we are not alone um, in our group. Um, we are not alone for sharing our knowledge throughout Europe. The Wall Kitchen Garden Network over the last couple of years has been hosting amazing webinars on the whole topic of walled kitchen gardens. And um, we have one more, we had one on trained fruit as it happens in February. And we're going to have another one in April, which will be fantastic because it is going to be on the subject of Heligan, uh, which is one of our um, 
best, I would say, garden restorations that was done back in the 80s. You might re remember the television series about it. Um, so there is a link that I think will be in the chat to the information on the Walled Kitchen Garden Network uh, forum. Um, so you can join that one if you're interested in Heligan. And uh, here we go. It looks like Susan has got her screen up and running. So welcome, Susan, and please tell us all about the importance of trained fruit. Right. <coughs> can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Um, right. Well, here, here is my presentation um, based on largely on the history of training fruit in kitchen gardens. Um, going right back to the 16th century, I want you to see the huge, sorry, the huge variety of fruit that was available. Um, this is in, in probably in the Netherlands. Um, there's cherries, there's berries, there's plums, pears, apples, nectarines, um, all of which were, sorry, I can't control this, were um, raised in Northern European gardens, even as long ago as 1563. Um, however, the techniques for um, raising fruit trees were obviously fairly basic. Um, as you'll notice, this says translated out of Dutch by LM, that's Leonard Meager, um, by Dutch, I think he means foreign language, not necessarily Dutch. Um, and again, it shows very primitive uh, skills of grafting, uh, even again in the 16th, late 16th century. Um, then we come to the Tudor garden again, 16th century. And if you, you can see here that the walls are low enough for people to look over and therefore not really much good for growing tall trained fruit trees. Um, I'm sorry, I can't stop it jumping about. I'm doing this again. Even if these are fruit trees, which we don't particularly know, um, I'm trying to, to explain to you the very slow process of actually growing, growing trained fruit in, in, this, in this country in particular. Um, this picture of a, of a fruit tree is actually pretty basic. It's what we might think of as any old fruit tree. Um, again, the technique for pruning is more or less absent, let alone training in any way. And even Jean de la Quintigny, who created the Potager de Loire for um, Louis XIV, was it, in, in, six, in 1680 in, in France, in Versailles, uh, these pretty basic pruning uh, drawings are really, I think, if you were trying to follow them as a gardener, as a practical gardener, you'd find them pretty much useless. However, it did show the interest in, in, in pruning trees. Round about the middle of the early 18th century, um, the Dutch particularly and the French created the dwarf fruit tree by grafting onto uh, paradise stalks. These little trees were immensely popular in, in uh, in gentlemen's kitchen gardens, at least in England. But again, you can see on the walls, there's nothing like a trained tree. It's just a pretty wild and woolly thing growing there. However, this gentleman here is obviously very proud of his little fruit trees. Again, the first ever um, instructions for fan trained trees appeared round about now, again from the Netherlands. Um, nothing much more elaborate than a fan. And then in England, 
we began to worry a bit more about climate and producing fruit. And from, from now on, it is the climate rather than the training of the tree that um, occupies the gardener's minds. Um, here you can see some screens against a wall um, to protect the trees from frost and cold weather, also from um, marauding birds. Uh, and then uh, we see this rather cunning training of trees for taking up the space that these fan train trees have not yet occupied. Um, the, the gardener has planted vines which grow above in the spaces between the trees and above them. Um, th this, this kind of gardening obviously um, became popular around about the 18th century. Um, what's his name who lived in Selbo? Uh, Gilbert, Gilbert White describes his own garden as having a wall planted with trees in this fashion. Um, meanwhile, over in Switzerland, uh, a rather eccentric man called Nicolas Faccio de Duillet uh, decided that um, <coughs> trees needed the most of the sun that they could get, and the best way to do this was to grow them on slopes. Um, this is a complete fantasy. I don't believe it was ever created, but you can see that the trees are growing on these slopes. Um, this this uh, idea was taken up in England um, quite quite enthusiastically. Um, this is Gwenton in Cornwall. Uh, the logic, of course, of growing a fruit tree on a slope like this is that um, a the branches would all go up vertically in any case, and you'd have a job to peg them down to keep them flat. B, if there was any fruit, it would get extremely muddy. And C, it was easily accessed by mice. Um, there are perfectly good fruit walls here in any case. So I don't know if this was ever used for fruit tree training, but it, I put it in to show you the lengths to which British gardeners were going in order to improve their fruit tree production, not by training, but by protecting from the weather. And then um, the uh, Elizabethans invented the curved wall, which they thought would help to contain the sun's rays as they moved around uh, for longer than if it was a flat wall. In fact, walls became extremely important and here again, we have a, a, a beautiful serpentine wall made out of cob. Um, again, fruit trees grown on serpentine walls are somewhat demanding because of the curves. And I think gardeners found that once the wind got out of this wall, it would swoosh round into the curves and out again, and cause quite a lot of damage. However, it was all part of the experimentation that was carrying on in the 18th century. And then some bright spark invented the heated wall. This is the wall in section facing south. This is the shed behind, and this is the little furnace with a fire in it. And these are the divided off flues, which were horizontal like um, serpentine flues. And then for added protection, a glass front was put across across the front of the, the south front of the wall. This was very popular. However, it meant that gardeners had to keep the fires going all night in the frosty weather. Um, in fact, at Tatton, we tried an experiment where we found a heated wall. And as you can see, the um, smoke was pretty prolific. Another reason for putting the kitchen garden as far away from the house as possible. And then, according to legend in Scotland, this garden here was created, it is a sort of lozenge shape, within a rectangular kitchen garden, especially for fruit. The legend is that it was built by Neapoli Neapolitan, Neap Nap Napoleonic prisoners of war. 
Um, and they were very cunning. They put wooden um, protectors on, at the top of the walls for the sunny side and tiled protectors for the rainy side. And this is obviously a little peach tree. And this garden is still going strong in Loch Ness in Scotland, if you're ever lucky enough to visit it. Now, there was a lot of clergymen writing about fruit and vegetables for some reason in the 18th century. This one was a bit of a villain. He invented what he called horizontal shelters. Um, these were slates fixed into the wall, projecting a little way out. And the idea was that they would protect the fruit blossom from the descending frosts. I've outlined some of them in red. Um, he published this rather elegant um, illustration to show what he meant in a book. And he had a visit from a man called Mr. Collins, who discovered that he'd only just that very day practically stuck them in with cement. So that in fact, they had never been actually tried out. But it goes to the extent, it shows you the extent to which British gardeners were anxious about the weather rather than about the training. I can't see that this tree has had very much training. Uh, they became a bit more sensible with, Victoria, with the Victorian era and decided to put glass shelters hanging on, um, on these struts at the tops of walls to, to help protect their fruit trees. And if you go to Chevening, uh, which is unlikely as it's private, <coughs> but if you do go to Chevening, you'll still see these structures at the top of the wall from which these things were hung. In fact, you see them in quite a lot of kitchen gardens in England. And then there was a very ingenious man called Thomas Hitt, who was the Royal Gardener at Kensington. Um, in 1757, he wrote a book um, describing how to grow fruit trees. And he had decided that if the wall went down all the way to the base of the roots, the roots didn't have enough room to spread. So he designed walls with arches. So the roots could go both sides of the wall. And if you're ever excavating a kitchen garden wall, you may sometimes come across these strange arches. However, over in France is really where the art of fruit tree training was taking off. Um, this wonderful, amazing tree of eight branches is just one covering the many, many, many acres of wall in uh, the Portage de Loire in Versailles. And this is the kind of chap you need to keep it in order. Um, indeed, it is to France that we look nowadays for the excellence excellence in fruit tree training. Uh, I would give a lot to have a garden like this. I'm not so sure about that. It looks like a lot of hard work, but it is very beautiful. Meanwhile, in England, all we cared about really was growing the biggest fruit trees we could possibly manage. Um, if you've ever been to Calais in Scotland, you, you may still see the remains of this amazing fig tree. And again, here is the very important fellow, the gardener. I think we were better in England at indoor fruit. This is the vinery at West Dean, trained by Jim Buckland. Um, absolutely perfect example of fruit tree training, even though it is a vine and not what we usually think of as a fruit apple tree or pear tree. Beautifully trained. And obviously, the better trained it is, the more productive it becomes and the more healthy. Um, English gardeners were very anxious to make the glass houses in which they grew their fruit the right shape for the fruit, whereas a vine needed a long, low leaning roof. This is the peach case, which only needed a narrow um, corridor and again, growing fruit both on the back wall and the front. And um, a fruit tree grower named Thomas Rivers, who I'm sure you've all heard of, was very keen on, um, on dwarf fruit. He invented the orchard house, um, making sure that 
rather charmingly that the path down the middle was wide enough for a lady with a crinoline to walk down. So all these trees would have been grown in pots. Um, very much dwarfed by the pots. But again, um, quite an entertaining way of growing fruit and very productive. Again, also rather beautiful because you could take the fruit, whole thing, pot and all, to table and the guests could help themselves from the fruit from the very tree on which it was growing. Um, there was a bit of eccentricity going on in England. What on earth persuaded anyone to do this, I don't know. But the remains could still be seen at Cropsteth. And then we do have this enormous reverence for our very most ancient fruit trees. Goodness knows how old this apple tree is, and goodness knows how productive it might be. Uh, probably not very. Um, but it does just prove that in England we were capable of producing um, an espalier. And once again, I'm taking you back to Calais, where you can still see the fig tree, um, slightly ragged looking, but still growing in its space on this lovely curved wall. And here we have a bit of English eccentricity, a pear house, a, a pear tree on a house in Yorkshire, um, carefully minding the windows and obviously rather interestingly starting in the next door neighbour's garden. It's been hijacked. And if you go to Scotland, um, to Mertoon, you'll see in the fig house this most beautiful, excellent piece of fig tree training. It can be done, it is done in Britain, but you need somebody like this. He is the fifth generation of gardeners to be on this one garden. When he's gone, I doubt if the fig tree will continue in its beauty, in the beauty that which you've just seen. However, there is hope. Um, my husband grew this apple tree at Babington in Somerset. There is hope. Keep going. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Susan. Every time I hear you speak, I learn something new and those amazing eccentric gardens. It's fantastic. And I really think that your note about when Mr. Breed goes, um, who will follow? I think our next speaker, Andy Lewis, um, who hopefully will be sharing his screen shortly, will be an example of the young gardeners who are actually coming on. And he works at an amazing garden called The Newt. Uh, incredible name. I'd love to know what the origin of that is in Somerset, which is southwest England. Um, and he has started pretty much from scratch, I believe. He'll be telling us all about it. Um, and showing how the microclimates are still being used in the UK. So, um, Susan, if you can hold on um, and to the end of Andy's talk, we hope that people will start putting some questions in the Q&A button uh, for both of you, and we'll have um, a little session on questions and answers after the coffee break. If you can hold on that long, that would be great. So Andy, do you want to unmute yourself and see if you can share the screen and show us some wonderful pictures of the fruit that you grow at the Newt? Excellent. Okay, you can hear me okay? Perfectly, thank you so much. <coughs> I just remind you, Andy, while you're just getting ready, yeah. a lot of our um, audience, as I said, I think before, are not native English speakers. So nice and slowly and nice and clearly. I'll do my best. I will try. It's uh, not used to public speaking as I'm just a gardener, really. But we do have quite a unique experience at the new in terms of everything we do. Um, so I'll start by quickly addressing your question, why we're called the newt. So we're called the newt because we have a population of great crested newts on the estate and within the formal gardens. Um, originally we were called Hadspen House because of Hadspen House and the Hadspen Estate. Um, and we still have the main house, which is 
still known as Hatspen House, um, but the new estate and gardens got renamed the Newt because of, uh, in homage to the Newts, and let's say probably the uh, the cost and trouble they caused in the the development of what's occurred. So um, <clears throat> we are we're we're on a historical site of an old garden um, of many historical features, but we've undergone a, a huge restoration and redevelopment so the newts um had to be uh cared for and looked after so we've we've um because of the travel they caused we called ourselves a newt i believe so i'm going to run through um what i do so my name is andy lewis i'm the lead fruit grower here at the newts we are a team in the fruit team which i've just managed to, to break away from ornamentals let's say of one and a half, I guess. Um, so we're pretty busy um, in terms of what we do. And we are a, a, a building and growing garden. So we keep making new areas or creating new areas, which often ends up with some fruit or especially trained fruit. I look at walls differently now. Whenever I see a wall, I just think, oh, what can we grow up that? What can we do? Um, <clears throat> which normally ends up in me having to do more work, but that's fine. It keeps us, keeps us in the job, which is great. Um, so I've been here around seven years, and as I say, we've undergone a, a, quite a, a large restoration. And what we're looking at here is known as the parabola, um, which is our walled garden. It has this unique D shape. Um, and as far as I'm aware, there may be one other garden in Scotland with this D shape. This is our, our archivist that told me this, but I'm not too sure. Um, but the parabola leads to that, that name and shape. So, um, <clears throat> Complete redevelopment. Also, I said it was Hadspen House and, and the Hob Houses, and also historically the Pope's Garden here. So it used to be an ornamental garden that was lost over time. Um, so it was a complete blank canvas for our owners and, and more importantly, our, our lead garden designer and architect to redevelop. So it was. Um, uh, turned into what it is now, which is our, our collection, which you can't see here at the minute, but our collection of trained apple trees. So within here, uh, we have um, 660 apple trees, uh, which translates into about 300 different varieties, and they're all laid out <coughs> in their county of origin. So the idea was to give people as much interest as possible in terms of finding old varieties, um, but also varieties from their home county or trees they used to, to know about. Um, so as we're going to take in this, we're also going to look at the various aspects of the outside wall. So uh, <clears throat> running along here is our south wall. So we'll get to have a, a look at that. Um, <clears throat> and that's an an area that obviously is, is a lot more sun drenched. So we have our, our plums and cherries there, which we'll get to. And then as we come to the outside of the wall here, <clears throat> this is east facing. So we're gonna run along here uh, with the slides, hopefully. And then you go from east and it runs into to north facing here. So our shady wall. So this is something that our uh, visitors, so we're, we're an open garden. We have daily visitors as well as hotel guests and we run <clears throat> garden tours. So we find out what people are really interested in and the reason people visit gardens in terms of, you know, for, for um, to be inspired, but also to learn. And, and the question we get is what can we grow in a shady wall or a shady spot? So um, these particular parts of the wall are, are interesting for people to have a look at. So we'll go to the next slide. And so we're gonna be here in our next slide, just so you get an idea. Um, and what we have are six plateaus within the wall garden. And these have our sort of um, sort of significant, large, significant trees. So <clears throat> this is the man, Gilles Guiu. So um, I mentioned Patrice Taravella earlier. He's our lead garden architect, and he's one part of the duo that is Patrice and Gilles. And Patrice and Gilles created a uh, monastic garden in France called Puer de Orsain in the Loire Valley, and they created that over uh, over 20 years. And Patrice being the designer and Gilles is known as the Espalier artist. So I've been lucky enough to work alongside Gilles. He's come over for the past four or so years. COVID obviously put a bit of an end to that. So when he next comes back, um, I'll probably be in trouble because uh, he's left it to me for the last two years or so. Um, but a complete <clears throat> inspiration to the garden you know it's you know he really is a true aspire artist everything we we do we do for reason and purpose it's looking at the 
you know, most importantly, the utilitarian work, you know, making sure it's done for a reason, what are we going to achieve? But then second to that is, is the sort of the uh, aesthetical quality and the, the art form within it. So everything we're doing is, is for, to, to create something, but it's also we know we're a garden that's open to the public and we want it to look good and people to enjoy it and really to inspire people and give people ideas. Um, so we'll move on. So can't really, I'm going to talk about the, the various walls, but can't really talk about our trained fruit without talking about our wooden structures because it's just so pivotal and this is a big thing that we've taken from Gilles. So this is early on before we planted, you can see we still have the building site at the other side of the wall, but we were safe, safe-ish within the walls of the wall garden. So <clears throat> wooden structures, these are sweet chestnut loves. The installation of the wooden structures was roughly two years, give or take, with various jobs going on and various plantings. Um, and I take this quote from um, viewers, as trained, trained fruits only ever as good as the wooden structure you're supporting it with. You know, it's, it's so important. If you need a, a vertical cordon for that structure you're tying to, to be perfectly um, vertical, Bamboo is fine, but that rots off in you know two or three years, really, and it's not always as straight as uh, what a larve might be. Um, <clears throat> the irony was when we were doing this installation, I'd not so recently, I recently bought my house, so I was removing larve and plaster from the inside of my house whilst at work um, installing larve. So it was a bit of an undertaking. So <clears throat> talk. I know we're going to talk more about train systems and vinyls and wires. The whole of the inside of the wall has vine eyes um, and wired system. So then it was a attaching the, the chestnut larves um, with wire. So I'd never really done it before, but I did a quick count up while I was prepping for this presentation. And just the wall, so the inside walls of the wall uh, garden, um, there was around, we'll go to the next one, around 4,000 of these that we put on to attach the, the larves to the walls. So you can see why it took us two years along with other jobs. Um, but, <clears throat> and one day we were doing it and the owner who's always um, around, he sort of thanked us for what he was doing and is always interested in what we're doing. He said, one day this will be in a gardener's magazine or something. And I said, okay, great, that's good. When your fingers get pretty sore doing it. Um, they never did make it there so far. And to be honest, you put so much work and effort trying to make it as beautiful as possible and it's such an important part of it but um once you get the trees on it you actually lose all those wires but i think what it gives you is whenever we have our visitors it gives intrinsic value everyone can sort of feel the time and effort that has gone into it and the care they also see us working and see the care and the attention but uh realistically once the trees get away and uh, once you have foliage and the distance you are you don't actually see um the time you've taken into to doing that but um i feel it's, it's an important part of it and it's really it's what people really enjoy looking at and seeing when they visit the garden so what we have here is that same wall that we looked at <clears throat> and as i said we have 660 trees on our inside wall it's all french varieties all, all rennet apples um, and the idea was that, that these trees were planted as six-year-old trees so pre-trained in france and belgium geo sourced these and the idea was we just wanted something a little more mature for our visitors to see when we open in 2019. the vast majority of trees we planted were all just maidens and that's all our english varieties but these were a little older, something larger. And also, you know, you can see we had fruit after we had had the first two years of removing fruit. Um, then we allowed them to fruit and we, we came across that. So this is back <coughs> across the garden a bit. So what we have is a, a collection of various forms within the walled garden. Um, diagonal cordons, Belgian fence, um, palmet oblique, arculopage, which we'll look at in a minute. Um, <coughs> So another part of our sweet chestnut loves. And really the, the idea is with our wooden structures, it really gives formality to the garden. It shows people um, what you're trying to achieve. And the way this garden is, is laid out is the idea is an apple maze. So before the trees have got to their full height, it does give you that structure and formality in the garden. Coming from Patrice, our designer, he created the walled garden in a, a Baroque style. So from that first image, you should see how 
geometric and formal the flowing paths were and the idea with with trained fruit is is uh, with that baroque theme is order on nature so we're we're sympathetically manipulating the trees i tell our visitors when they get worried about us cutting them back or tying them in um so we're going a bit further <clears throat> again so this is creation um chestnut larves again this was a common site piles of larves as you're working the the idea with these they should last 20 to 25 years i've been told promised by gilles um and they they, they you know they've been in for four or five years now i think um and, you know they, they soften in terms of they don't look like fresh wood anymore i mean soften them on the on the eye uh, but they're still very hard and hopefully i won't be redoing them anytime um, soon so that's the same belgian fence but with the trees in so i think that pictures a year or so ago um, and as you can imagine as as maidens they were all planted as sort of single whips um, so we've got a lot of formative pruning and forming shape shaping of the trees um, as we go, lots of tying in, lots of pruning. Um, all right, so I put this one in because <clears throat> I know we're going to talk more about modified and full lorette pruning systems. And I guess we go with the, the full lorette system um, through our education from Gilles. We prune in February, June, August, and then also a little bit in, in sort of September, October time. And, and this image I put in because it, um, for me, gives um, reason and value to why we should, this is before we've pruned in June. Um, I'm gonna steal this quote from Jim Buckland when I took a trip to West Dean is that trained fruit should always look like trained fruit. Right now, this isn't looking so trained. It looks a bit more like a hedge or a bush against the wall. So uh, there's no clear leaders tied in and we haven't cut back. It's really nice and I love it when it is like this because it looks healthy. Um, but for me, when I look at it, you know, we, we need to be tying in and we need to be cutting back. And it's it's really nice to see that. And I don't have this, I'm afraid. The before and after, when you see this and then um, after you've cut back to really and then take it back to that formality and showing the design. But then again, it also shows with the wooden structures giving you that look uh, beyond that. <clears throat> so I've got two pictures now. Um, so um, this particular. Uh, variety. So this is um, our double horizontal cordon. And I just put this in, we've just finished winter pruning now. Um, and I just put it in because it just, from Gilles, he's given us our education on how we should work with our trees and the idea with to always fill our bottom tier before moving up onto our second tier, whether it's a, a horizontal cordon like this or an espalier. Um, and with our various pruning regimes. So I think this is one, two, four years, looking like four years in the making. So each year, each winter prune, we cut back to around 30 centimeters like this. So we knew that it would take four or five years to fill here. So we would cut our vertical leader here, a much harder cut to have in that five year period. That was a final cut there. So we come up to here and now we've achieved this full length. So now we're ready to begin this one because a tree always just wants to be a tree and it's always going to send the vigor and the main growth to the top. But now we've achieved this tier, we can work on. So I put that one in there. Um, <clears throat> I don't, it wasn't, um, oh yeah, I did mention the counties. Anyway, we're in Wiltshire now, just so you know. We just recently ran some of our, our workshops and um, Visitors and people are very interested to, to be like, oh, I was in, I'm in Wiltshire now and Somerset and it's, you know, it's, it really does give value and interest to people having the, the different counties. So I took a picture of these two trees, uh, Arcure Lepage. So it's, it's my favourite form within our walled garden. Um, just like, I like the artful sort of bending on it um, and the form. It's a bit tricky. So these are, <laughs> these are two of the better specimens. We have ones that aren't as good as this. Um, but the reason I took these two is just because with what we're trying to do here is really to get all our, our bends as, as sharp as possible. Again, coming back to that Baroque nature and order on nature is to get, you know, almost right angle um, corners in what we're doing. So it makes me happy, especially this one. It's always easy to get this bend to go nice and straight because it always wants to go up. It's this one where you're trying to actually bend it over. Um, but I'm, I'm happy with what we're, we're doing there. And 
bringing it back to Gilles again, I remember the first year we were, were training these. So at the, the first year, they were just vertical cordons. And the first job was to, to bend them in to go this way. And I was working for a couple and did one. And of course, it snapped um, because it's quite a harsh bend we're doing it. <clears throat> and he just ignored it. It was, you know, it's one of those things that happens. But at that point, I'd only been working with him for a number of months. I was like, oh, didn't want to, you know, just hated it, didn't want to do it. And he goes, oh, it doesn't matter. Just cut it back very hard to a bud below the point of, of interest. And he says, we, we try again next year. So it's really, you know, and what I found with running workshops is to give people confidence and to tell people that it's fine, it's okay, it's easy. Um, so, yeah, there's a couple of nice trees, I thought, in Wiltshire. So um, within our walled garden, predominantly all dessert fruits, uh, but what we do have is a, a few uh, sections of crab apples. The idea is to have a a prolonged season of fruits later in the year, um, but also a significant blossom show. So I have three slides here of our crab apples. So this was taken last week as well. So this is uh, red sentinel, I think. So bursting bud first, just coming along. Um, and then I've got the three seasons. And really, you know, if we're talking about environment and aspect and, and microclimates, this particular part of the wall here is incredibly dark. This is, um, so this is north facing right in the corner here. And we always joke about this tree here. This one at the very end is, is a vertical cordon and it's Jelly King. It's absolutely fine. It's right here in the middle and it's just as vigorous as these ones here. So it shows that, that um, crab apples are pretty tough um, coping. So <clears throat> it's actually a different wall, but it's, it's the same. Uh, train regime so you can see why we have the crab apples for, for blossom uh, along there so we've we've kind of freestyled what we did here starting as vertical cordons but then we've gone with crisscross design that you can see in the first picture so we have traditional training methods like the belgian fence and, and those kind of things but also um making up some some unique features again people love to see that kind of stuff um and then another part of the crab apples again you can see why we need to do our june prune i couldn't wait till august to, to prune this back it'd be you know it'd be ridiculous um and also because we're in the formative um years of forming the trees we really want to get the vigor into the leaders so you know we need to tie these leaders in and get that shape um tied in then also check back our, our um, laterals and you can see fruit there that needs to get some additional light to it. So uh, we definitely need to prune a, a few times over the year. Okay, so we've left, left the apples. Um, <clears throat> so I probably spend about 70% of my time with the walled garden, whether it's inside it or outside it. And then we have various other plantings that we work on. But um, here we have our south wall. So obviously a, a sun-drenched wall, your traditional wall. Um, and this was taking a, a week or so ago again, I believe. Um, I'll go, oh, sorry. Okay, so same picture pretty much, um, but it looks a bit, possibly a bit nicer. Uh, but I also always talk to our visitors. We run uh, daily garden tours about um the, the the value of trained fruit for winter interest you know this is lovely and it's nice looks healthy but really if people want to see the spurs and see the shape and the form of the trees winter is, is often the best time so if you're trying to create a garden for, for winter interest i always say trained fruit is a good thing to do so sun drenched wool uh fig cherry plum damson, quince, various fruits all along our south wall, all tied in. And I really enjoyed the picture from Kate, I think it was earlier with the wall. I really like seeing, I know the wall was bare, but when I look down the wall, I like to see, see like your, your, your border was very narrow as well. It's really the, the trick and the art and what gives me the most pleasure is if I put my head almost against the wall and look down it and see that everything's only 20 or so centimeters off the wall. That's what gives me the greatest pleasure is trying to see that everything's and that's just a series of tying you know we do as much or more tying in than pruning really to really keep that um, formality so that's the uh south wall again and it's just to highlight again it's more of the sweet chestnut laughs and it just when the, in the early years of the trees 
it just helps to give you added interest. It shows what you're trying to achieve with your with your fans. And again, winter interest. And, you know, from, from visitor experience, people really enjoy seeing these kind of things and it inspires them um, to create these. So this was quite early on after planting and that looks like a quintet blossom. Okay, so... Um, Andy, of... we're getting towards the end of your slot. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll rush through this. this. Um, <laughs> sorry. So we tie in everything on our south wall with, with white sheets. We've got a hotel here. So rather than using the linen like they did traditionally in France, we've got a hotel with upcycled white sheets. So uh, again, it's something that gives people interest. Cherry tree here. We talked about a low wall earlier in Susan's one. So we have a low wall here, it's just part of it. So now this year we're um, bending our branches. And so for the next few years, we're gonna create freestyle curves coming over. We'll see if that works out. Uh, Mirabelle in an open book fan. So uh, vine eyes and wires, at the end of larves, you've got the issue of movement. So we use nails. Um, so if anyone's got issues with larves and things like that, it's a good technique to use. We talked about uh, meddlers the other day, this is on meddler wall. We've got the, the buds bursting here. Um, and again, it's just to show the nail how it works there. So outside wall, this is the east facing wall. So a bit more shady, early sun and early uh, morning and early afternoon sun. So again, it's creating these uh, larves. Gooseberry, um, so gooseberry, black currants, tolerant to that kind of thing. Um, and that's running on the east wall like we talked about, and it runs further up to the north. So. How long have we got? One minute? Go on then. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> so um, freestyle, we, we, we created this form. Using this book, we, we, we came up with an idea for these. And they, this is moving around to the north face of our wall. Um, so we have sour cherries and medlars, so shade tolerant varieties. This is a Morello within its first few years. Um, and it's got a little bigger now establishing. So a shade tolerant tree that will hopefully give us fruit for our, our chefs. West facing wall, same design. You see how the nails are uh, holding this. And this is actually a persimmon. So we've got five or six different persimmons. No flowers or fruits yet, but hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll see how it goes. But it's worth it just for the foliage almost within that. Um, this is our north wall. So uh, pink, white, and red currants running around the wall. We have vertical port cord on pears and jostaberries. Jostaberries seem to be vigorous wherever you put them. So the idea is they encircle here and then this is a year old, we've actually got them along here. So the idea is to maximize wall space and really to, to fill it up. This area wasn't actually finished when we opened and people, did I leave it in? Yeah, so people were visiting, I put this in because it's proved that I do actually do some work. Um, people really enjoyed seeing that kind of thing. So um, I said one minute, crowns. Crowns are another thing. You have to come and visit the gardens. Rather than pruning, we bend the branches. Um, the idea is to slow the sap down get buds to burst along here. I like this one because if this wasn't bent round, it'd be about two or three feet long. But by bending it, we're getting this feature going on. But also it means that our fruit is gonna be within that 15 centimeters or so close to the main because our next tree's here. So we've got to keep everything close. Crown three years old, uh, naturally grafting in terms of uh, you know art form within trees. Uh, people love seeing this stuff. It's great for a grafting workshop to prove to people that, that trees will graft naturally to give people confidence. So in terms of things like this, stones to weigh down the, the laterals. This one was an over vigorous um, shoot like this. So by using the stone to weigh it down, it's bent it down. We're pruning as well. We then hopefully it looks like a, a fruit bud here. People really enjoy these kind of things. It's little features within the garden that they notice. This is another wall garden that we're working on. So a new design of loves. And then our, I'll end it here with our cider house because everyone loves cider in the Somerset. So we've got a variety of cider trees here. They have a, a, a series of single varieties, Kingston Black, Yarlington Mill and Red Streak. Um, so we've planted those on MM106 rootstocks to fill the bottle. And this is on an M25 rootstock, Harry Masters. And we've just got to get it to the top. Um, I've pruned this, we got to here, somewhere around here, and I've pruned it back to around here this year. So another year or so, and we'll, we'll fill the, fill the apple, well, uh, get to the top, take another oil to fill it. Um, and that's it, and that's called a dream. So that's, that's it. Sorry, I dragged on. 
No, this is all. I could have watched that for hours, but what I'll do is I'll have to come down and have a look at the garden. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so it's just a big pitch to get, yeah. get you guys in the garden. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, now, if you could um, stop sharing your screen, um, we're going to get Hilary, Hilary Thika, who is from the one of our oldest gardens in the UK, and that's Hampton Court. Um, and uh, she's going to start sharing her screen in a minute. While she does so, I'm just going to say we do uh, ask you to put some questions in the Q&A slot for our speakers, because after the coffee break, they're going to be answering your questions. And I'm sure I've got quite a few questions, but unfortunately, I can't type it in as a panelist for some reason. So it looks like Hillary um, is ready uh, with her presentation and she's going to talk about fruit growing as an art form. So Hilary, take it away, please. Are you there, Hilary? We can't hear you. I saw you just now. Yes, you're still muted. <laughs> Here we go. Let's start again. Okay. Okay. Let's try again. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so good morning. I'm talking about uh, fruit growing as an art form today. And I think we've had a fantastic example of that from Andy's uh, talk there. Like, uh, if that isn't an, an art form, then I, I don't know what is. Um, so since this webinar is about trained fruit in historic gardens, I'm going to be looking at this from a historical angle using Hampton Court Palace for reference, which is where I work as the kitchen garden keeper and vine keeper. I'll talk a little bit about the history of fruit growing here and then talk in a little bit more detail about the techniques that would have been used by the gardeners historically and the influence and importance of fruit growing at the palace. And I'll compare that to what we do today, what we grow and how we do it. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about the grapevine, which is the world's oldest and largest grapevine, which also lives at the palace. So this is Hampton Court Palace, which dates back to 1514. It's located in the furthest southwest part of London. It's got a rich history, including the Tudor, Georgian and Victorian periods. The palace is owned by the Crown, but it's run by the charity Historic Royal Palaces. And it's famous for its gardens, which attract many visitors each year. And the gardens are laid out around the outside of the palace, as this map shows, and this all sits within the wider area of Bushy Park and Home Park. Each of these different sections of the gardens have all got very different characters, as you can see from this slide here. Now, just to focus on the history of fruit cultivation at Hampton Court, um, one of my main sources for this was an article by Jan Woodstra, which is full of information about this subject, and I've included it in my list of references, which I think should be available at some point. So this guy on the left is Henry VIII, who was the English king between 1509 and 1547, and he famously liked his food, fruit included. Henry created what became known as the Great Orchard. He also employed a king's gardener who had the exciting sounding job of traveling to find new fruit varieties and then collect them and grow them. As well as this, he commissioned a large orchard to be planted in Kent, importing plants from the Netherlands, and this began the spread of orchards across the region. Now, although Henry became an infamous historical figure, he was a driving force between a lot of new innovations in industry. The painting on the right is from later on in the 1670s, which shows King Charles II being presented with a pineapple by the royal gardener. Now, this isn't a time period which is most associated with Hampton Court, but I do like this picture because it shows the prestige that was associated with being able to grow new and exotic things at the time and the importance of the gardener's role. However, a few years after this painting would have been made, the area which was Henry's Great Orchard at Hampton Court was turned into an area of trees and hedges with paths winding through them, which was known as the wilderness and was kind of more fashionable at the time. Then with the beginning of the reign of King William and Queen Mary in 1689, a new kitchen garden was developed. New walls were added between the existing ones for growing fruit and providing a sheltered microclimate. George London was in charge of the gardens at this time and together with Henry Wise, he wrote this book, The Retired Gardener, which is a translation of a French gardening manual adapted for an English climate. 
Um, this book tells us a lot about the horticultural practices of the time. And there's a great emphasis on planting fruit trees. And there's also an extensive list of the different fruit trees grown at Hampton Court, which is available, that's also from around then. Now, not many people's job description dates back 324 years, but this is a warrant to the superintendent of the gardens from 1698, which we can compare to maybe the head gardener's role today. And this quote shows the extent of the work that was done in the gardens at the time. I won't read all of this out, but it shows that there was a large workforce of different skill levels, that the procurement of dung, as they put it, was a priority for growing melons and making hotbeds. Looking through the list of tools, there's a lot of equipment that would have been used in fruit cultivation. Uh, they supplied fruit and herbs to the palace and they grew salads, which is much more than what we would think of as a salad nowadays and would have been a large variety of vegetables, herbs, flowers and fruit. Uh, I think this might even be uh, one of Susan Campbell's drawings in here, actually, and uh, another one that was used earlier in this, this webinar. Um, but we do know that between the early 18th and 19th centuries, there was a period of real innovation, as was mentioned before, with a lot of new varieties being bred and more fruit being grown in England. Um, we have some information about the techniques that they might have used and just the general growing practices of the time. And one of the sources that we can look at is a fascinating book from 1731, The Practical Fruit Gardener, written by Stephen Switzer. As with a lot of similar books, it's incredibly detailed. In the chapter recommending different fruit cultivars, eight pages are devoted to the ideal qualities of peaches, including exactly how hairy each fruit should be. Along with advice on grafting and root pruning, soil improvement and cultivation, there are interesting chapters talking about forcing plants to make them produce fruit out of season. And this is something which would certainly have taken place at Hampton Court and elsewhere to provide luxury of fresh fruit to the royalty and to the very wealthy. Um, London and Wise in The Retired Gardener, they described using pea homes as an umbrella attached to the wall to protect the fruit trees in the spring. And Switzer goes on to say that mats can also be used, which would have to be taken on and off to allow light and air to the tree. He describes how a wooden shelter would have been built around the tree with removable planks to protect them from fluctuations in temperature during flowering, or covering them with wooden hurdles with a thin layer of thatch to protect the trees on frosty nights. Uh, there's a great description of how they used to force cherries by stripping the leaves off a mature tree in August, then uh, dig it up and carefully replant it against a wall protected with a reed panel with hot manure piled against and underneath the wall and the manure was replaced every two weeks. And through this incredibly labour intensive method, they were able to make the tree produce fruit early in the spring. Um, the brick walls were specially constructed to radiate heat out, and this was further improved by adding stoves, which allowed the hot air to move through tunnels in the walls. And in this book, he hints that there might have been some trial and error involved in getting this to work and finding that it wasn't enough to only heat the upper parts of the plants, but that it was also necessary to introduce heat lower down, warming the soil and roots while keeping them well watered and adding fresh soil regularly. There would also have been other designs of heated glass houses with stoves and heating pipes. And all of this would have been an expensive process using a lot of foot fuel. So it was suggested that the heat could be used from laundry and kitchen buildings if they backed onto the fruit forcing houses. But this was all a delicate process and they didn't want to overheat or scold the trees. And having a barometer at the end of the forcing house meant that they could adjust the practices according to the weather. They would have had to open and close the glass lights in their greenhouses and frames regularly, depending on the weather and the daylight. They would have had to put trays of water in the glass house to increase the humidity when necessary and modify their watering and pruning for maximum fruit production. Um, some of his descriptions we might be a bit less keen to apply today, though, such as an attempting to get rid of pests and diseases in an orchard by wheeling around a smouldering barrow full of burning straw and manure to fumigate, or as he puts it, refine the air. Um, it's interesting though that he's similarly dismissive of what to him were ancient gardening practices. And he mentions an old belief in warding off pests and diseases by using the skin of a crocodile. I think Switzer is justified in saying on the last page of his book here that the English gardeners arrived to the greatest perfection in their art. And reading it now as a professional gardener, it is astonishing the amount of work that it must have taken. Not only that, but the skill of the individuals doing it, which I don't think the majority of modern day gardeners would know how to do. 
another book from later on in 1812 was George Brookshaw's Pomona Britannica. This collection of illustrations used a lot of fruit from Hampton Court as examples and is still widely regarded as one of the best works of its kind. Uh, we can compare the pictures in the book um, to the cultivars that we grow in the garden today, such as the pear, swan's egg, um, the Moor Park apricot, and also these black Hamburg grapes from the grapevine. And the gardens here continue to be used as an inspiration for artists, and the Hampton Court Palace Floral Legion Society continues the tradition of producing botanical art. Uh, looking at the history again, from about 1830, there was a sudden decline in fruit growing at the palace, right up until 2014, when one section of the kitchen garden was reconstructed based on the original layout from the 1700s. And this is the kitchen garden today, or rather what it looks like in the summer. And here we grow a wide variety of fruits and vegetables, which are then sold to visitors on a market stall or supply the cafe on site. There are 254 no-dig beds and around the perimeters, there's a band of soft fruit. Um, beyond the main path of the garden, there are flower borders. And then we have our train fruit trees against the walls on the outside. And these trained fruit trees are an important part. They're an important feature of the kitchen garden. They've got a lot of history behind them and they form an attractive background to the garden and they demonstrate different growing techniques and make the best use of all the vertical space, all of which could be applied to other gardens. I'll quickly run through now the fruit that we grow at Hampton Court. Firstly, apples are probably one of the best examples of useful heritage cultivars. While the fruit might not have some of the characteristics that modern varieties are bred for, they often have a really good flavour and you can't get a better apple than one of these freshly picked Worcester Permain on the bottom right picture here. Uh, most of the apples are grown as espaliers. They look great and are a classic formal kitchen garden feature. Most of the pruning for these is done in the summer using the modified Lorette system to shorten the laterals growing off each horizontal arm. And this allows a lot of fruit production in a very small space. Espaliers can also be grown as a fence, like here in the 20th century garden at Hampton Court. And uh, pears can also be espaliered or grown as a cordon and are pruned in a very similar way to an apple. There's a central quince tree in the garden and we also have a wall train specimen, which is a little bit unusual since they don't normally grow as neatly as an apple or a cherry does. However, it has been done successfully here and it looks great when it flowers and bears fruit. And around the central tree, there are now some figs in pots here. Um, we're lucky enough to have an occasional volunteer who is also an artist who comes in uh, a few times a year and is very knowledgeable and does the pruning for us. We grow some fan and cordon plain trained plum trees against the east and west facing walls of the kitchen garden, which look really nice at this time of year, um, just to have that blossom covered fan when the garden is otherwise looking a little bit empty. And in the summer, this plum, a type called Hagnata, produces these large, huge, dark blue fruit. And we also grow old fashioned green, green gauges, which are delicious. The north facing wall of the dark garden doesn't get as much sunlight or warmth and is used for growing apple espaliers and morale cherry fans. Trellis wasn't generally used in the Georgian kitchen garden with the trees being directly tied to the pins which were nailed into the wall, uh, some of which still remain in place today but we now use a trellis to protect the historic walls. On the warmer walls in the garden, there are peaches and nectarines and this Moor Park apricot, which is a historical cultivar, which was pictured in Pomona Britannica. There is a fan train peach that makes a really great focal point at the end of the main pathway. I think it's only fair to mention that no garden's perfect and fruit grows on these trees each year but if I'm perfectly honest, a lot of it does get eaten by birds or squirrels. Uh, we now have very few staff to run the garden. Um, myself and my colleague Itcheho and a team of volunteers are kept very busy weeding, harvesting, planting, pruning, looking after the vine, carrying out other maintenance and talking to visitors. So netting the wool fruit is unfortunately often a job that slips down to the bottom of the list of priorities, but uh, maybe this year we'll find the time. There's also a plat band of soft fruit bushes that surrounds the veg growing area of the garden, which contains 180 currant bushes and 70 heritage apples on very dwarfing rootstocks, surrounded by a short box hedge. This is an area that we do get more fruit from, since it's easier to put a net along the whole bed to protect it from birds. And last year, the bushes produced lots of red currants. Um, this is a before and after photo of what the winter pruning looks like. 
Um, we grow a lot of rhubarb, which isn't really a fruit, but it's eaten as a dessert. As a dessert so I'm going to quickly include it here. So nowadays we don't have the resources or the infrastructure to grow fruit out of season the same as our predecessors did. There also isn't the same incentive to do so. Fresh fruit is imported and available in every supermarket and isn't the luxury that it once was. Rhubarb is an exception to this, which is still grown using a basic forcing technique. We cover the rhubarb crowns with a special terracotta pot in January, so they've got relative shelter from the elements, and then they start to grow when the light is excluded. And we get these long, pale coloured stems that grow very fast and taste really sweet and don't have the stringiness of older rhubarb. Along with asparagus, it's one of the first crops to be ready in the spring. And I think it's important as a vegetable grower to have something to look forward to in every season. And this is a real treat to enjoy at the end of winter. We have tried to replicate one of the old methods for growing melons, though. Here's a hotbed being created using fresh manure, which gives off warmth as it ferments, which we put a layer of compost on top of. However, we found that these particular beds didn't really get up to temperature, which I think might be because they just weren't quite high enough and didn't have enough mass to build up enough heat. We just use this area as raised beds for now and they produce a nice salad and then a few melons in the summer. But our predecessors obviously had this down to a fine art and we're not quite there ourselves yet, but it would be great to experiment with this more in the future. Hampton Court is also home to a collection of citrus, which is kept in the nursery glass houses behind the scenes over the winter and it's then moved outside to the orangery in the summer. And there's also a collection of fruits on the south front gardens, including this persimmon, um, some all trained fruits and an orchard of larger trees. And these techniques that we use today have been developed over years by the application of gardeners knowledge and skill and creativity. While they might not have had the same understanding of subjects like chemistry and biology, the horticultural practices of the 1700s appear just as advanced as what we do today, and perhaps more so given the intensity with which it was carried out, and all the more remarkable for not having access to chemical fertilizers or pesticides or electrical heating or lighting. Instead, they had to rely on their ingenuity and what was available to them at the time. And this is a quote that appeared on the website of the Wall Kitchen Garden Network just last week um, from the conductor, William Christie. And he says that you can put a tree like that in the same category as a beautiful painting or a beautiful sculpture or a beautiful piece of music. And he's absolutely right. A gardener creates something just like an artist does. Planting a border, they'll consider the colours, composition, shapes and textures, just like an artist uses layers of paint to form a picture. When a gardener is pruning a fruit tree, it's just like a sculpture. They'll be thinking also in four dimensions, considering what will grow years later. They can prune to encourage or restrict growth and achieve the desired shape. They'll have to use their understanding of how the different trees growth habits to decide how to do this and when's the best time to prune. Art is often a slow process and the best results in growing a fruit tree are often from resisting the temptation to prune too drastically when you've got the pruning saw in your hand and have the patience to shape a tree over a number of years, not removing too much growth all at once. A good example of fruit growing as an art form is in viticulture. Grapevine pruning, especially the concept of gentle pruning, considers the flow of sap through the vine to create an open shape without any blockages in it. By shaping each individual vine, you form an entire unique landscape in a vineyard. Uh, this photo, by the way, isn't at uh, Hampton Court, it's a uh, Skeins Hill. And growing fruit and vegetables competitively is another whole world of horticulture in itself, and this is most definitely an art form. Here we see an exceptional level of care and attention to detail, as well as commitment and creativity to create something amazing. A prized vegetable or a collection of fruit right, might represent months of work and years of experience, just like a great piece of art. And I hasten to add, these grapes at a competition last year were grown by other people and they're, they're not from the gardens here. And just to finish, I'm going to talk a little bit about the grapevine, which is the world's oldest and biggest grapevine. It's a black Hamburg planted when Lancelot Capability Brown was head gardener in 1768. And there's been a long tradition of having a vine keeper and now that responsibility has fallen to me. So no pressure. So this last part of the talk is just a little bit about the maintenance of this amazing plant. The vine's over 250 years old. 
it's four meters around the base of the trunk and these rods or arms extend along the length of the greenhouse the longest of which reaches 36.5 meters it occupies its own glass house this one is the fifth or sixth on the site and was built in 1969 it has this viewing area within the glass house so visitors can walk through and see the vine at the moment in the winter the vine is in its dormant phase this is the time for pruning, bark scraping, and then applying a winter wash. It's also important to keep the vine house generally tidy and get rid of any debris that might harbour pests and diseases from year to year. In the spring, as the temperature increases, the first shoots start to appear. Um, the greenhouse has heating, so we don't have the same worries about frost as anybody trying to grow vines outside. There's rapid growth in the spring and early summer. Vines in general are really vigorous plants, and although the trunk is indoors, the roots are spread over a large area outside, and this is regularly fed with a thick layer of manure. This means lots of pruning, cutting back those new shoots. This photo was taken after it was all done, working from one end to the other using scaffolding and this walkway above the viewing area. So it's one of those jobs where by the time you reach one end, you have to go back to the other and start it all over again. The next job will be thinning the bunches of fruit. This is important to prevent overcropping. And then over a few years in, oh, sorry, over a few weeks in September, I'll harvest the grapes. On average, it produces 270 kilos of grapes a year or about a thousand bunches. I'm not sure when this photo on the left was taken, but sometime in the 20th century. But the process of packing the grapes is exactly the same as it was then. Although I don't wear a suit and tie to work, which would be a great look, but maybe not the most practical as it gets incredibly hot in the vine house in the summer. I weigh the bunches, and inspect them and remove any damaged grapes and then box them up and take them to the palace shop where they're sold to the public. The grapes used to only be, be consumed by the royal family and the, the bunches of grapes were even numbered to make sure that nobody else took any. But now they can be enjoyed by anybody who visits the palace. They're a nice fruit. Um, for eating as a dessert grape, although they do have seeds in, so they wouldn't be suitable for making wine from. And shortly after the harvest, it's autumn, so the leaves start to change colour and fall off. The main job at this time of year is raking the leaves up and collecting them. And then it's time to start the process again, so pruning out all of last year's growth, forming the structure on which the vine will grow, and then fruit on again next year. Then um, finally, I like this photo with the two people at the end of it, just because, think, because I think it shows the scale of the vine. And um, having such a striking plant as this, I think represents what's important about conserving heritage fruits and growing techniques. The grapevine has taken over 250 years and generations of expertise to create what we see today. While a lot of these skills are no longer needed for commercial fruit production, they're a part of our heritage, they are an art form, and hopefully we can continue to take inspiration from the past, uh, continue to learn, and then preserve these skills into the future. Yep, Thank you so much, Hilary. That's absolutely fascinating. I, I was going to try and stop you because you slightly overrun oh, but hearing that sorry. about the grapevine. No, don't worry. Um, I haven't heard about how you actually manage that and how you do the rest of the garden as well. I can't believe that. But anyway, um, hello, everybody. I think we're just about to come back after the coffee break. So good to see you still there, Susan, holding on in there. <laughs> Ah, it was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Andy, you're there. And Hilary, that's great. Um, so I think we're going to have some questions that have come in both on the Q&A, which I will read, but also a few have come in on the chat as well. So I'll try and find those too. Um, I wanted to begin with a, just a quick question for Susan from, from me. Um, after that, those two other speakers of young gardeners um, talking about their skills, are you a bit more optimistic about how these skills can be retained into the future? I'm, I'm not that optimistic, honestly. Um, I don't have any real evidence that young, very, that many young people are coming into gardening. But 
what is very cheering is that everyone is getting much more interested in <laughs> kitchen gardens. Yes. Um, there is a great deal of restoration going on. Um, whether it's all okay um, or not is another matter. Yes. Um, but also the whole thing does depend, all these restorations depend totally on having good, proper, professional gardeners. And without that, without these professional gardeners, and I mean professional, um, the things are just not going to work. They're going to collapse again. Mm. So it is a serious, a really serious situation. Um, I think the pay for gardeners is appalling. Um, and if maybe if, if that was addressed and people gardeners were paid a bit more, things would improve. But honestly and truly, who on earth is going to go and be a gardener, especially in cold and miserable weather, for a pittance? What's the point? <laughs> so um, it's rather depressing. That's all right. Um, Hervé, um, you have a point you'd like to make. Yes, please. Uh, it would be interesting to see in those young gardens that Andrew showed us and uh, or and Hilary too. I mean, whatever we saw living gardens instead of historic gardens, where is your forces? How many people do you have? Gardeners, do you pay them? Uh, do you have volunteers? You know, it's nice to have visitors, but Oh. So it would be nice for people to do this. Okay, well, shall we start with Andy? How many staff do you have in your garden? Okay, so we are very lucky. We have private owners and we are well funded. So I know, you know, every day we know that we are a lucky garden. But we have on site 35 gardeners. But we are stretched, you know, it's, it's a lot of people, but it's stretched thinly. If I should, you know, the walled garden I show you, that's just me. Um, and I have some of two days a week and that's like I say 70% of the rest of my time I'm either at the fruit nursery crab apple collection so we have it sounds like a lot of people but we're actually still really stretched it takes um, me and the other guy about two weeks to do all the winter pruning of the apples and then not long after finishing that then we're going to go on to the outside wall but various bits so we we how many people we have, we run around in circles, catching things just before they burst bud and, and, and all those kind of things. And, and then once we you know, begin to get more and more fruit, harvesting, harvesting is a really laborious, you know, time taking thing. Our, our edibles team is one of our largest teams and they do all the kitchen garden and market garden stuff. It's the harvesting mid season that takes up a lot of the time. Um, we don't have volunteers because we're not a I think it's because we're not a charity, we can't take volunteers. So um, our staff is our staff and that's it basically. Um, but yeah, everyone just runs around and gets stuff done. And, you know, we, we, we want to make everything to the, to the highest standards we can as well. So mm -hmm. as the gardens grow, our, our team has had to grow drastically as well because we don't want to drop off in quality. It's kind of our unique selling point or we hope it to be is to keep our garden as, as um, good as we can. So yeah, I hope yeah. that sort of answers it. Okay, Hilary, how about you? Well, that's that's great to hear. That's really positive, and uh, I wish I could sort of, sort of say the same thing about uh, how things are here. But unfortunately, um, the charity that I work for has been hit quite hard in the past couple of years, um, and there's been a dramatic reduction in the number of gardeners, unfortunately, and um, a lot of experience has been lost as well because they're gardeners that have been here for a very long time. So unfortunately in the kitchen garden, it's down to just myself and my colleague Ichiho uh, looking after the kitchen garden, um, which is it's a lot of work as it's a very labor intensive form of gardening. And it's um, to, together with the vine as well, which we've also become responsible for. That's uh, I'd say it's, it's probably a little bit more than what it's really possible to to keep that quality that, that we all want to, to have. Like everybody who works here takes a great pride in the gardens and, and it's really important to us. So it is it is sad to see that there is a reduction in the number of gardeners. And I think that that's quite right, that it's an, an issue across all of the 
um, the industry. There's a real skill shortage. Um, and I think something does need to be done to, to get more young people interested in it. But um, on a positive side, though, I would say, though, I think that there has been an increased interest in Grow Your Own. Um, more people have started to take an interest in growing vegetables and, and things. So hopefully, like, we, we will get more people interested in it in the future. Good. OK, well, that's a perennial question, that, isn't it? Let's go to some more specifics. Uh, this is actually one for Hilary from Lucy Hart. Um, and she was obviously hearing your um, comments about different pests in the garden. And she asked, do you have problems with parakeets eating the fruit, which is a, a new <laughs> pest that we have in London? Yeah, well, we do have a, a population of parakeets in London. Um, they don't really give us any trouble in the kitchen garden, if I'm honest. Um, we see them around, they're definitely here. Um, but the real birds that are problematic for us are jackdaws, so a, a black uh, crow-like bird that they cause all sorts of mischief in the kitchen garden and are, are a real nuisance. But the parakeets, no, they don't really eat our fruit. And to be honest, I, I quite like them. They, they brighten the place up. <laughs> Great. And here's one for Andy from Rhiannon Williams. Um, and she wants to know um, whether you could give the name of the Espalier artist that uh, works with you, um, Andy. So um, his name is Gilles, Gilles Guillou. Um, I believe Guillou is, is French for guillotine, however you might be able to tell with that. <laughs> um, and they, they created the French garden in France, Pouet de Orsain, originally. Um, so Gilles, Gilles Guillou. Okay, so I was going to say earlier that there was a great um, webinar that was held by the um, European uh, Colloque um, and the Wall Kitchen Garden Network in February, where we had some wonderful speakers from France and Belgium. So it would be worth people looking back at that recording, which is now available, uh, just to see the uh, amount of people who have that expertise still in France, Belgium and Holland as well, um, who we could, if our networks that we're trying to create now grow, we could really tap into that expertise. So I'll just go to the questions again. Another one for Hilary. Um, do you expect that grapevine? This is from Jan Hovo. <laughs> Can you expect the grapevine to still grow for another few hundred years? Do you have any expectations? Well, it's, it's a good question. And we don't know, really, because it's, it is the oldest one in the world. So we don't know how much longer they can, can live for. But um, it would be great if it could. And we're, obviously nothing lasts forever. There's inevitably, there's pests, there's diseases. Um, it's an old plant, so it is at risk of some uh, pests that, aren't, um, that modern vineyards aren't susceptible to. So there is an element of risk with it. Um, but, you know, we're, we're going for it as best as we can and uh, would do our best to help it hold on for as long as possible. But it's it's not showing any signs of, of slowing down. Good. And are you propagating from it at all? We do take cuttings, yeah, yeah. So you've got some replacements should the worst happen. Yeah, I, I think there are a lot of um, Black Hamburg grapevines out there as well. Yeah. So it's a fairly common cultivar. And I think a lot of people will have them growing in the gardens and they they probably are like offspring of offspring from the grapevine, a lot of them. Yeah. Um, one of the questions here from Antoni Castian, I uh, wanted to know, um, I think from all of you, about the quality of the fruit that you get from this sort of complicated training. Is, are we growing these fruits in that way for the quality or the quantity or just the artistic merit? Susan, what, what would you say about that? Did you hear that, Susan? Um, not, not at all. <laughs> no, not to worry, not to worry. I was <laughs> just wondering um, about the quality of the fruit that's grown this way. Is it better somehow because it's trained to that degree? Supposedly it's better, otherwise what would be the point of doing it? Um, supposedly you get larger fruit, 
um, you can protect them from blemishes with paper bags and things like that, um, make it look better. Um, I can only presume, assume that it's better than if you don't bother with very finicky training. Right. I'm not actually convinced. <laughs> and how about you, Andy? You've now got some fruit trees that should be bearing fruit. Would you say it's worth all the effort? Um, I, I guess if I'm, uh, we'd come back to the um, utilitarian first and then aesthetical second. So it's, it's done for a, a purpose and a reason. Um, I mean, I guess another reason of, of training fruit is, is keeping it within picking distance and being able to work with it. And then the various uh, prunings and fruit thinning that you do, you know, especially with your dessert fruit, I hope that's going to achieve better quality and better size by um, sort of manicuring the tree, making sure it's getting the most light, but also just picking one or two fruits per square meter, let's say, of each tree. So I guess you're going to improve quality in some way, hopefully, by that. Um, I know our, tree, our apples look a lot different to the cider orchard apples that come in from uh, there, So, um, but that's not really a, a proper comparison. So I would like to think so, but I guess it's a balance of, of, of looking good and tasting good, really. Hilary, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I made the, obviously, um, what we're, we're growing, we're organic principled. And so in some ways, the, the quality of the fruit often isn't as as good if um, there might be some uh, damage, for example, by by insect pests that you might not have in um, a more commercial fruit production. On the other hand, though, we grow lots of like heritage cultivars, um, some of which will have a, an amazing flavour. So they might not be bred for um, long shelf life, for example, or to be transported easily um but some of the flavor will be fantastic so that's what i would compare it to mm -hmm. and this is a question that came in from viola johansson um what do you grow underneath the uh, fruit trees what's at the foot on the soil do you cover the soil or do you keep it bare andy um we kind of have a mix on the south wall we have nothing and then when our newest head gardener came in he said oh we should plant this up and is there's a mixture of uh, designers, garden architects like to keep it very basic. So they like that, um, you know, just simple. And I, I personally like that as well. It's just sort of emphasizing the, the, the fruit rather than what's below it. Anything that's planted below is then may disrupt when you come to putting your muck on and your feeding. And it's basically anything growing there is going to take away moisture and nutrients from the fruit trees. So if you don't want to focus purely on the fruit trees, I'd say it's it's nice just to have it mulched and simple. Um, but within the walled garden, the apples, we do have um, low growing plants. The idea is they weren't going to get up in the um, <clears throat> in the sort of light and the airflow of the trees. So only things that were low growing and didn't detract away from the apples. In one of, um, in Hillary, I think one of your slides I saw it was an apple and then I, shows my ornamental knowledge I think it's an echinacea um up within all the within all the fruits and the spurs you know and and for me I'm like like you know I just think all I want to do is think about the fruit tree and thinking about the light and the airflow getting to it and there's there's always going to be a, a balance of ornamental and fruit but for me to to keep it as, as low growing and airflow and light to the trees as possible if that's what you're focusing on I guess. Mm -hmm. Hilary do you have any answers to that? Yeah well we've got a mixture of both in this garden so as you said Andy there's um there's some borders like a, along the um the west facing border where um it's just what's kind of evolved to be there over time that various people have, have planted what what they think should should be there and it's it's one of the features in the kitchen garden is we'll have these um kind of banks of lavender plants along the the edges so there's a, a few lavender there I'd agree with you it might not be ideal to have stuff growing underneath the fruit trees of course because of the the light and air and competition and, and making it easy to get in there and, and work as well um, but it's, it's just in that particular area we've, we've got bits and pieces of all sorts that have been planted in there um, other areas most of the fruit trees that we've got we do keep it bare underneath um, the same reasons we'll just mulch around the base of the the tree um, to give them a feed and just just keep the soil as clean as we can and um, yeah easy to access as well 
Great. Okay. Um, so I think that's um, possibly, ah, here we go. Here's one from Kelly uh, for Andy. Um, do you have any trainee gardeners at the Newt? Yes, so we have an apprenticeship program that started two years ago. So currently we have three apprentices. Um, and then this March, we're taking on another three. So it's a two year program. Um, so yeah, we're getting, and, it, and because this was the first round of apprentices, we started with three. And I think as we move, you know, we're a very new garden. Everything is still being worked out as a business as well and a company. Um, so the emphasis is on training. So we have apprentices, uh, we take on various levels of gardeners um, um, and we'll do more and more of that. <clears throat> and in terms of um, educating or enthusing visitors, we're, we're beginning to run workshops now where we did um, pruning workshops this winter. We also did a grafting one. So getting more and more people involved with it as well. And we're beginning also to get local schools on board as well. So. We can't have volunteers, but we do get as many of the, the public to, to come and enjoy and learn as well. That's excellent. And that's something for the future as well, isn't it? Mm. Um, OK, so I think we've got to the end of all the questions that have come in. So I think we're going to make a start if. Um, yes, good. Keridwen is there. Um, because if we uh, do overrun, we've got a little bit more lead time now, I think. Um, so, Keridwen, uh, you're going to share your... No, you're not going to share. No, your, I'm going to show your slides. So let's see yeah. how that works. Um, and um, I'll just do that now. Um, here we go. So Keridwen <laughs> is going to talk about the practical side of how you actually um, train your, is that, is that coming up okay? Can you see the first slide? Yeah, yeah I can okay. see it, yeah. So I'll just um, introduce you, Kerry Dwen. So you uh, are the kitchen gardener at Dufferin Gardens, which is in Wales, in South Wales. And uh, you work for the National Trust. It's a marvellous garden. I've been there many times. And I know that you've really taken on the whole topic of how to get trained fruit back into the wall garden and done in the best possible way. Um, so, and as Andy said, it is the key is, is getting the walls in the right state before you put the fruit up. We, um, some gardens make the mistake of planting the trees and then trying to instigate the mechanics of training them. But um, you know better. So Kerry Dwen, if you'd like to uh, tell me when you need the next slide and I will move them on. OK. All right, so this is walls, wires, tags and trellises. And so it's an introduction to the support systems needed for training fruit trees in a heritage kitchen garden. So I'll give a brief overview of the structures used in the three, last three centuries in kitchen gardens generally, and then talk in more detail about the fruit tree training that's going on at Dufferin Gardens where I work. So next slide, please. Um, so the historical eras in Britain, um, I thought that as many of you from abroad, you might not be quite so um, savvy about some of the terms we use. Um, so when we talk, so the 17th century or the 1600s, and that was important in um, the UK because it's when the Huguenots came from France and Belgium and they brought lots of craft skills with them, including um, fruit tree growing and training. So the 18th century is the Georgian era. And this was marked by the landscape movement where gardens moved towards um, informality. And for the kitchen gardens, they moved away from the house. Often two or three acre gardens were built and um, sometimes divided into a couple of gardens, um, perhaps a large one and a small one. Um, examples of this, um, Attingham or Audley End. Within the landscape movement, in the Georgian time, there was the Rococo movement. And this is a very decorative um, style. And it went through the whole of um, Europe and that was 1730 to 1760. And so Victorian time in um, the 19th century was from 1838 to 1901. 
And in the, it's often considered the heyday of kitchen gardening and when it was most skilled, most sophisticated and the most resources going into it. Then 1900 to 1910, really into 1914 was the Edwardian or we refer it to the earlier 20th century. And this was the rise in, U in the UK of the smaller kitchen garden for the new money who wanted to have what um, the old money aristocracy had had. And it was about growing the best and the tastiest of the crops and the combination of beauty and productivity in your kitchen garden. So it was a place where the garden owners would want to take their visitors um, to enjoy seeing the blossom in spring, the fruit developing and ripening for harvest. And next slide, please. All right, and the next slide, please. Thanks. So this is the kitchen garden at Q Palace Kitchens. So Q Palace was one of the homes to uh, King George II and his family in 1720s. And it was an informal retreat from them where they could escape from London and then to where George III lived until his death in 1820s. The kitchen gardens, the kitchens were closed following his death, but they've been recently restored and open to visitors. So a small kitchen garden has been created by the palace kitchens to give the visitors a snapshot of Georgian kitchen gardening. To quote from the palace website, experience this little kitchen garden with neat vegetable beds laid out between gravel paths and fruit trees climbing the walls. This gives a flavor of what Georgian kitchen gardens were like. When they were in use, the real gardens were enormous and stood along Q Road. As you can see here on the walls, the wooden system for training wall fruit. Wooden trellises hung on the garden walls from hooks fixed to the walls. And some, this meant that sometimes the wind could catch the trees and lift the trellis. It was popular on heated walls and also stone walls where the lines of mortar were more irregular. Though here the walls are brick and not heated. Now could I have next slide, please? Um, sorry, it seems to have frozen. Ah, oh, there we go. It's, has that come through okay? I don't, it's not showing on mine. I don't know if it's showing on others, but my, oh, that's it. Oh, great. I think it's a slow, so, slow line to you. <laughs> yeah, I think I've got something saying it's stable. So, right. Uh, Pains, okay, okay, gone. So, if you didn't have walls in your kitchen garden, freestanding wooden fences could be built to create an enclosure and train trees along. These trees are in the kitchen garden at Payne's Rococo Garden, which was originally built in the 1740s in Gloucestershire, where the productive garden is in the centre of the garden. The beds and paths are lined with four-tier apple and pears trained along fences and made from wooden battens. The chicken wire you see is to keep the animals out from the veggie beds. This method was recommended in a book published in 1608 by Sir Hugh Platt, a writer and inventor of horticulture and agriculture who wrote, instead of privy hedges about a quarter, I commend a fence made with lath or sticks, thinly placed and after grace with dwarf apple and plum trees spread broad upon the stick. Uh, next slide, please. Are you seeing the other one now? Yes. Yeah. So you should have um, Attiem Park. Um, so another method popular in the 18th century and first half of the 19th century was to attach the tree with twine or pieces of fabric to cast iron nails hammered into the mortar joints of the walls at 23 centimeter intervals. Every year the ties and some of the nails would be removed and the trees adjusted. 
Celia Fiennes, who traveled through England on horseback um, 1685 to 1712, wrote, the first garden is square, the walls full of trees, nailed neat, an apricot, peach, plum, and nectarine, and which spread, but not very high, and between each is a cherry. This is the wall at Attium Park, taken in 2005, a few years before the restoration of the wall garden was started. The walls are Georgian, and although it was cultivated until the 1950s, the walls were never wired as the family fortunes wavered in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. As part of the restoration, the walls were wired as training and fixing the trees using nails would have taken an enormous amount of a skilled gardener's time. Can I have the next slide, please? So another way was to fix circular walls, circular eyes into the walls at regular intervals. This is Tintsfield near Bristol, where oblique cordon trees are tied into the wall via vine eyes. And the kitchen garden at Tynesville dates back to 1860. And you can see this in nails as well. Um, next slide, please. So moving on to the late Victorians, the 1890s, um, this is Dufferin. So um, in, from then onwards, um, the walls had um, fixings placed at ends and regular intervals along the walls and wires tension between them. After the idea came to Britain from France and Flanders in the 1870s. At Dufferin here, a long metal straining bars um, were set into the walls and the wires tensioned by adjustable screw um, fixings. When the tree is planted, hazel rods, bamboo or wooden battens are tied to the wires and the tree is tied to the rods as they grow. The angle of the rods are adjusted through the growing season to slow or increase the speed of growth to create a balanced tree. Once the framework is grown, the branches are tied directly to the wires. These are the copies of the 1894 straining bars and they were reinstalled um, at Dufferin about six years ago. This is the west side, uh, the west facing wall um, between the large vegetable garden and the fruit garden, which is the other side of the wall. And we planted them with um, sweet cherries and apricots. And um, next slide, please. So, Dufferin Gardens, the Edwardian. So this is the fruit garden at Dufferin Gardens. Although predating the Edwardian garden design of much of the ornamental pleasure grounds at Dufferin, the two kitchen gardens are being restored as an Edwardian kitchen garden. The house and the gardens were developed after being bought by the Corey family in 1893, a family who had made their fortune through the shipping and mining of coal in the South Welsh Valleys. They are now listed as grade one gardens and considered the best example of Edwardian garden design in Wales. In 1906, the family commissioned the landscape designer Thomas Mawson to develop the pleasure gardens. He saw the kitchen garden as a place where the garden owner would take their guests to enjoy the blossom in spring, watch the fruit growing through the summer and the ripening in autumn. He did some embellishments to the walls and created another entrance in the larger veg gar vegetable garden to join it to the pleasure gardens. So he saw it very much as integrated in the garden. The post and gardens uh, details you see are taken from Thomas Marston's The Art and Craft of Garden Making. He recommended either metal posts fixed to the ground, fixed into the ground, or preferably oak posts with a wooden top rail and wires underneath to train the trees on. He also thought that posts should have a round or pointed newel post to prevent the rain seeping in. As when I started, uh, we had a very, very limited budget and um, we used soft wood fence posts. These do rot at the base ground and we are planning to replace them with oak posts and metal covering the wood just above 
above and below the ground level to um, stop the decay. Um, next slide, please. So um, I put this one of the new in because it was very much a modern, I felt it was a very mo modern reworking of a heritage um, kitchen garden. Um, and the um, alternative method um, is, which I was very impressed here, was to see, um, to fix the desired shape to the tree with the wooden strips, as Andy has talked in great detail about it was, and tie the tree in as it grows. Um, and that, what I was taking was that it actually shows the visit to the future and it created a very striking visual um, from the adjacent path as you walked around. And it introduced the visitor to what's coming when they go through the gate, it lures them in. Um, next slide, please. So talking about Gasbeek and really the perfect heritage kitchen garden. So in September, 2016 and February 2017, I went to the Museum Garden Gazbeck in Flanders. So the garden was built by the Flemish Regional Government Department of Nature and Forests, um, a team led by Marcel Vossin, in 2006 to show the history and skills of Flemish kitchen gardening with the emphasis on the late 19th century. The standard of horticulture is outstanding um, with the training of fruit trees a speciality. And talking about the, the skills and developing the gardeners, um, Marcel Vossin actually grew up on um, a market garden. Um, so he learned from his, his parents and his grandparents and he how to do the fruit trees. And he himself um, started fruit pruning, pruning fruit trees age 10. So here it's a what well, I would call them the continental way, the French and Belgian methods of wall wiring are show, and they are um, similar to what the Newt has done. So when they had the walls built, they built into them um, with strong metal fixings shown at each end and at regular in intervals along the wall to keep the wires close to the wall. They then used um, modern plastic wire as it would last longer and they're stretched horizontally every 40 centimetres um, up the wall with tensioners at, end, at the end. Vertical hardwood battens have been fixed to the wires every 30 centimetres. And so they've actually drilled through the battens and threaded them onto the wires and then use other wires, as the newt did, to hold them in place so they don't move. Then um, for the... If you're doing curved and diagonal shapes, the desired shape of the tree is then mapped out in wire, which is tied fixed to the wooden battens. So as the trees grow, they are fixed to these wires, um, or if they're, if they're curved, if they are um, a vertical one, they can go straight to um, the battens. So the borders at the below the trees planted in is only 40 centimetres wide and then there is the path. If it's wider than 40 centimetres the tree will grow too vigorously and be difficult to control the vigour. And wiring the walls like this allows a great number of styles to be grown especially the curve forms which are very visually pleasing. The trees are also keep them well balanced and more uniform and combined with a detailed pruning regime they grow plentiful crops of very large, but very tasty um, pears and apples, and they have very little uh, disease. And so they obviously use um, the full on the right system. Um, next slide, please. So all the tensioners, ties and other fixings you need. Um, so there are a number of different fixings for wall wiring, depending on the time period. So the top, starting from the top left and working around clockwise, the top left is actually the Victorian style vine eye that they decided to go with in um, Attingham. Then um, along from that, we have the newt with their modern vine eye um, mixed into the wall and with the turnbuckle tensioners, uh, which are good for um, adjusting and ensuring that the, the vi um, wires stay tight as they will move over time. 
Next, we have the replacement um, late Victorian metal bars um, and with an adjustable belt and a square, we had a square nut on them. So we decided to go for that little detail on that. Um, then you have the, at Gazbeck, they went for the um, wire adjusters and, and these are really good as because you can keep on um, adjusting them over a long time. You don't run out of room to adjust them. Below that is the um, pair wall projection glass roof. So one wall they had just put this, the little glass roofs on the top of the pairs and then you see a hook below and that's for hanging a linen curtain on. So during cold spells when new, or when you knew frost was coming, you could hang the curtain and that would protect the blossom, a young fruit from frost damage. Then we actually have tying the um, tree to the wood or to the wires. So this was an ornamental, but it's been in Brussels Park, um, in a Brussels Park where they um, were still using the traditional way using willow. This is obviously soft and will not damage young branches and it's biodegradable, but it's a very skilled technique. I don't think many gardeners um, do it. At Gazbeck, um, they did use modern rubber or plastic ties onto um, the true trees and that's quick and it will last a long time. I used hard string um, because at the trust we have um, a minimal use of non-biodegradables and tarred string does last longer. Um, I did use untreated uh, jute string and I was um, re retiring every year, sometimes twice a year, because we do have a very wet climate here. And also in the center, don't forget drip irrigation. This is a, obviously a modern thing, but drip hose and leaky pipe is very good for concentrating the water in the root area. It's, um, wastes less water and reduces fungal diseases and also saves a lot of time, which is something we're all trying to do. Um, and it gives given the even flow of water, which is especially important when the trees are young and a good amount of vegetative growth is needed to create the framework. Um, next slide, please. So historical information. And so when deciding, obviously, how to um, restore the garden and what to put back, um, the decision um, helps of which method is fixing a best for the garden being restored. While at Dufferin, we did have some um, wires. We could see some damaged um, original fixings from um, 1893, 94. Um, it was great to actually see these. Um, when I came to Dufferin, I was told all the family and estate papers had been destroyed. Um, these were the straining bar and wiring quotes for the kitchen gardens at Dufferin, um, and which I've only found out about them several years after I started working in the gardens. The bars were installed by the glass house manufacturer and messenger, and the documents were found um, when somebody was doing, I think, research on the glass houses in the archive of the Messenger Glass Houses at the Museum of Rural Life in the University of Reading in England. Um, other, photogra other photographs, um, documents have helped in the restoration of the kitchen gardens and some photographs that were taken for a magazine in about 1910 and the surveyors and auction auctioneers sales particulars from when the estate was sold in 1937. These are held at the Glamorgan archives. Um, local papers have often given us a lot, lot of information about things that are happening, um, plantings, um, the employment of lady gardeners, what happened during um, the First World War, World War, which was very defining for the gardens. Um, and so the National Library of Wales has put um, a massive archive of local Welsh newspapers online, making a search a lot easier and quicker now than it used to be. Um, the head gardener of the time also wrote a lot um, for local newspapers and he gave an RHS um, journals and magazines as well. Um, and so the RHS is of magazines and papers and their library is a good um, source. Also, while Corey um, asked for his papers to be destroyed, the people he corresponded with didn't. And so, um, and 
a lot of um, correspondence of other gardens and garden owners have been kept. And certainly he had correspondence with the Hidcut and their researchers have uncovered um, documents and, and research that has been used, especially plant these, um, lists. So I would always say to, to look around for secondary um, sources and then it, they do came up, come and they are very useful. Uh, let's slide, please. So how is this all being applied at Dufferin? Um, this is the Bothy wall or the west facing wall of the fruit garden. On the wall wiring in particular, it's described as a pear wall. Using money raised from produce sales, the straining bars were reinstated about five or six years ago. Um, we also, um, concrete flooring from a 1960 to 1990 glass house that was built um, by the council when they had the gardens before it went to National Trust. Um, unfortunately, um, the concrete was base was left in um, when the beds were reinserted over the top. So we managed to um, have the lower um, bed, that concrete's been removed there, but we're not quite sure at the top, we think there's some bits left. Um, this wall is very important for the visitor experience as they walk around the garden. Uh, they can see the wall um, when they look through the arch from the larger upper um, garden. So it can, kind of pulls them through. And then after seeing the styles and the high level of fruit tree training in the museum garden at Gazbeck, it's been decided to add the wooden battens, even though we have no idea that they were used um, in the UK, in um, Dufferin, we don't think they were. Um, we decided this because um, the aim of the Dufferin Gardens overall for the trust aim is to um, make it a center for high horticulture in the area. Well, in the, in the, in the country and to have um, a real high visibility. So next slide, please. So this is the plan for the Bothy border. Um, and so we will work out the costing and we de I decided um, to go for some curved shapes at each end and then um, the Palmet Verrier. Um, I chose this because they are, the Palmet Verrier, um, it's easier to form um, a balanced shape. If you go for the W cordon, um, that's very difficult. I've done that in one small area um, and it is quite demanding. We don't have the money to buy the Palmet various or the double use in um, already um, trained like they did at the new. That would have been lovely, but we're going to have to go um, from the basics. And the and the cordon on day, the curved shape, the wiggly wave shape, I've not seen in gardens over here. So that would be something unique. So we're going to put battens um, every 30 centimetres and three metres long, and the battens will be two centimetre by two centimetre. And we're going to go for hardwood Oroco. Um, and the wood, we were advised by the wood supplier that battens um, should be two centimetres by two centimetres, because anything thinner than that will um, not be stable over such a long length. So, for the cordon on day, the wiring wave curve patterns will be added to the wooden battens. And for the palmet area, the verticals will be tied to the wooden battens. But as the garden is on a slope and the wires are on a slope and they're angled with the slope, short horizontal battens will be fixed to the vertical battens for each tree at the U shape. And this will ensure that the tree would be balanced. If we didn't do this, there would be a tendency, I think, for them to move and shift. And then one side of the tree will grow more than the others. So we need 80 vertical battens and then 14 90 centimeter ones and 14 30 centimeter guns for the horizontals. And that's been costed at approximately 2,000 pounds. So, um, as we're spending all that money, so we're buying that. And then we'll have to rely on. Um, us or the DIY volunteers um, to drill the holes in their battens and thread them onto the wires and then fix in place. So we'll have to redo the, the wires. Um, so we actually have, and this is sort of about the restoration and obviously within somewhere like the Newt, they had a big amount there of commercial organization um, and they wanted it at impact right at the beginning for us, um, we've got no date to fix the plant, um, the trees and to buy the trees yet. 
So we'll probably, the DIY volunteers, we've got two very skilled DIY volunteers um, that we can be able to do this job um, for us um, for the fixing of the buttons because me, I'm just fully occupied doing the all the growing in the kitchen garden. Um, and then hopefully they'll do that over this year and then we'll have to um, order the trees and then um, that will probably maybe a year depending on whether they've got um, the fruit supplies or so we'll buy them in as um, single as maidens and train them over the next few years. Um, um, next slide please. So in the confusion really um, about what to go and what's appropriate for your garden. And as we've seen, um, not always um, what's there, or what has previously been there. You have to decide what's important about your garden. Um, and we talk often about spirit, in the trust we talk about spirit of place, and we also talk about layers in the garden. So we don't have to be slavishly in one time period. And, and so it's, what's the messages you wish to give to your garden? Is it bringing back horticulture, bringing back high horticulture? Um, is it just to get fruit and um, vegetables grown in the kitchen garden? And it's like also thinking about what adjustments you need to be made for the fruit growing to succeed, like Kate's decision with the creators um, um, to adding them um, to wire the walls. And so also it's really important to think long-term. Um, at Gasbeck, they said their structures to last for 50 years. Um, and that's why we're using the Eureka hardwood. Um, and also, will there be enough skilled labor? We've all touched about this to prune the trees for many years to come. Um, certainly we've been knocked, like Hillary, we've been knocked by the um, last few years. I did, once I started working here and we eventually were able to have a seasonal person, but she was actually here for, um, 20 months over 22 months um, but then unfortunately that position went we had hoped that we were going to be able to training up and she would become um, full-time permanent but that's disappeared um, so now it, I've actually been occupied a lot of the time in recovering the garden um, we our volunteers as well were for were stopped for 15 months I continued so I was able to do the fruit tree pruning and keep them in shape um, but it does, and also, do you need to do the whole garden or can you do, we're concentrating on two walls where, where we put them back because those walls were in the best state as well. The other walls, those weeds growing out, um, brambles, um, it, they need repointing. Um, and there's been discussions about even a bit of one of the garden, whether one of the walls needs to be knocked down and rebuilt um, because it's leaning, but we don't certainly don't have the money for that at the moment. If you decide um, that you can't have them got the resources to wire your walls and things, you can always go for 3D fruit growing. Um, this here at Gasbeck, this is at Gasbeck here, and four different varieties have been trained around a goblet and a metal frame. And then more varieties have been grafted on in layers as the tree grows. In this way, 16 um, varieties can be grown on one structure in a relatively small area to give apples, um, a supply of apples through the ripening months for several months to go. And it looks really, really effective. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much, Kerry Dwen. Um, that was really interesting seeing some work in progress there. So I'm going to stop sharing now because I'm hoping that Jim is there. Um, we're not seeing you at the moment, Jim. Um, so if you could unmute yourself, there you are, brilliant. And now, so Jim, um, you're going to start screen sharing, but I'm just going to introduce you. Um, we've still got Susan here, which is great. So I think of Jim as a similar um, inspiration on the practical side of fruit growing. So he's been working for the Royal Horticultural Society for many, many years, specialising in fruit at Wisley. And uh, that's uh, the RHS garden in Surrey. Uh, so if you want to see fruit grown to perfection, uh, head to Wisley, one of our um, very many gardens in, in the UK that ha does have well-trained fruit. 
So Jim, um, would you like to start screen sharing? And you're gonna tell us about, actually now we've got our walls wired and ready, we're gonna plant some trees. What should we plant and how should we look after them? Looks like Jim is still, ah, here we go. Perfect. Well, good morning. So we're going to talk about trained trees today. Um, some of what, how you do it, but also showing different trained trees, not just at Wisley, where I've, as I say, worked for a long time, but also other places, including other RHS gardens, which I have some involvement with. And I think, as with other presentations, I've got at least one slide from Garspeak. Um, where I visited as well. So, you know, this fruit trees can be grown in a range of shapes as we've seen and either two dimensional or three, three dimensional forms. So they're really useful. And of course, aspect and microclimate, which um, is particularly useful in cooler and wetter parts of areas that you grow, particularly sort of um, north and western parts of the country here. So, um, that certainly helps raising the temperature and um, often making things drier as well. And you can use them on structures and sheds and so on. And they are useful in home gardens as well. So you will see some images I've got of, of trees in a more um, sort of domestic situation, I suppose. But to mention, I mentioned the pruning and we're I'm talking mostly about apples and pears with um, summer pruning. And what we've mostly used is the modified Lorette system, which is pruning, the summer pruning once a year. It does also involve some pruning in the winter if you need to thin out fruiting spurs and other sort of work, particularly as they, as they get older. But it's pr predominantly one summer pruning, which is to get the fruit growing on short fruiting spurs and we prune as the growth slows down in late summer, which um, so it's a very much um, season, seasonal and sort of growth stage based rather than calendar based. So that can often be um, early August for pears, mid to late August for apples, sometimes as early as late July for pears, but it does vary. And that was really um, awkward in 2021 where we had a lot of rain and just continued to get growth so um so it didn't get didn't get pruned till early september which you get less than less benefit then from fruit bud forming that year but it was quite a difficult year so the pruning we would normally do um of a you know mature um tree would be pruning shoots greater than secateur length which is about 20 23 centimeters something like that to um three leaves from the basal cluster so you've got the basal cluster of leaves with leaves close together then three leaves beyond which if it's from the main stem but with most but but one leaf from the basal cluster from an existing spur which is probably about two and a half centimeters in length so that's sort of pruning we do um with younger ones you do occasionally do some pruning earlier in the season as well and particularly if you've got competing shoots and so uh, we would talk about um espaliers being um these with central stem and horizontal tiers but i know in many countries of the rest of europe we, uh, they would use espaliers as a term for all the trained trees of different shapes on walls so you know, the, often I'll say espalier, I mean this, but of course there are many other, other, other forms as well. <clears throat> but yeah, they do look very good in, in flower, which will see coming up soon. This is a pear, so it won't be so long now. And that tr that particular tree is um, quite big, about sort of uh, four and a half meters by 2.4 meters. But they work very well on a smaller scale. And this was at Wisley, the fruit garden. We've had some change, changes recently with a new garden being constructed. And this, this tree is one of those that doesn't exist anymore. 
but this is on two fence panels so ideal for a home garden we often have that size and this would have been trained from a part trained espalier in this case so the sort of thing probably makes it easier particularly for people growing them at home so you buy it with two tiers already started and then develop from there and that's a Williams von Chrétien not far off picking time either on that one and a slightly bigger espalier one of our older espaliers we have a about 70 meters with fan train trees and espalier train trees on either side and this is one of them it's a Woolbrook russet um, so quite a that tree is about 60 years old but to start off is espaliers um, here's one that we started we started this from a a maiden tree, a single stem, so wasn't part trained, and that's been trained out. You'll see there at the ends of the arms, we've got um, bamboo canes in this case, but I agree they look much better with square laths and we have square two centimeter by two centimeter strips, which we did use in other trees we did. But whatever you're using, these are used for training the extension growth during the summer, so it's tied out on those canes because if you don't tie it it either grows upwards and then it's difficult to bend flat later and if you tie it down flat straight away of course it starts to curve upwards so if you grow it at an angle of about 45 degrees it's not that critical the exact angle you can then lower it at the end of the season and one thing i, I think with um, training them it's always important to tie in any shoots um, quite often as they grow and certainly before you summer prune them because with experience of many different people pruning trees rather than it's really great if you perhaps have one or two who do the trees every year and have that consistency there's a great risk but even if you do it yourself actually you can forget is that you can prune off the shoots you meant to tie in so do always tie them in first um, because I say it can be with different people doing it, but it could also be that you just don't concentrate and chop off your extension growth or something. So get it nicely tied in before starting with that. This is going on to form its next tier. You can see here we haven't pruned, uh, sorry, created one tier at a time, which I know Andy was mentioning earlier, which I think is really good actually to do it that way. You probably get a better tree in some ways, but um, there's always that level of impatience, I think. Um, so here the, they're started. But the only thing I would say, if they're tending to dominate, you might might stop that and not create the next tier and let the others develop a while. So this one seems to be working fairly much in balance. So uh, that formative pruning would be in the in the dormant season where you cut to um, just above the above a wire for the next two tiers next two shoots you want and uh yeah try try training out shoots to the side and um training in the middle if you find that the lower tiers or any tiers are not growing as vigorously then we would raise them you raise them up a bit and they should start to grow more vigorously and on the other side if they're growing too strongly you can lower some so raising and lowering those arms certainly helps balance out growth if you have a issue with that and sometimes when you come to prune the central stem um, it doesn't work so there it's just produced fruit bud rather than a growth growing straight up so that would have to be cut back again and possibly the two shoots on either side so that you start to get some new growth to form your tier and growth growing straight up so yeah, yeah, it's always good to see the perfect examples, but they're not always perfect. So that one, yeah, there has been a, see it's stopped. So we'd have to do something about that. And it's useful, I think, as I think one of the other speakers mentioned, to have almost a little bit more vigor than you need is better than not enough if you're trying to form these trees. Of course, one of the best forms for home gardens, but also for other gardens are the cordons. You can fit a lot into a, a small space um, and they do establish quite quickly. So they are quite useful where you're wanting to 
form cover some walls in quite a short space of time. Um, and a lot can be fitted into a small space here about 75 centimeters apart and again at an angle maybe of 45 degrees or so which helps them become more fruitful so a very good form by having a many different ones in a small space it can be interesting for the different um having different cultivars but also of course helps with pollination by having a lot of different ones there and they're used on a shed so yeah even in um, public gardens, we sometimes have sheds that need covering, as well as in sort of our own gardens and allotments. So, um, although that shed went last year, it's no longer there, but um, that uh, can work very well. And that's a uh, you know sunny wall of a shed. But they're at West Dean, so can be used in that sort of range of places, from grander gardens down to down to sheds. Here pears, well, previous shot was apples. And they do tend to fruit quite well and they will establish over just a small number of, you know, for just a few years. And there, uh, again, where we showed them on two fence panels, uh, we've also shown that the end plant, we've taken up an extra branch or two to fill in the triangular space you get left at the end. That I think when that was taken and just had some winter pruning, which you'd do to thin out crowded spurs. Um, otherwise, it can get too dense. You get perhaps too many fruits and also not enough air movement. And the uh, horizontal cordons or step overs that are often known have proved very popular and work very well as a border here with two branches, one going in either direction. I actually quite like them with one because if you want to create one with just one branch going in one direction, you can get a, a maiden tree, one that actually isn't too strong because um, then you can bend it over. So you can get it bent it, bend it over and take it in one direction and that can establish the tree in quite quickly. Also by having a bend rather than a cut, which you have when you get branches going in both directions by bending it you often don't get much vigorous growth at the point of the bend it works quite well but also needing more vigorous more dwarfing rootstocks for those and I'm going to mention a bit about rootstocks towards the end yeah and here's some U and W cordons I think we didn't used to see them as as much um, in Britain as we do now, often bought in as part train trees and they can look, you know, very good. And just 30 centimeters apart between the uprights of those usually. And there's one in a pot. So you can do train trees in, in pots as well if you want to. And here we had a steel frame made up by one of our engineers on site, sort of welded that and put that together for us. So, uh, you know, made quite a nice, nice tree. So obviously with pots is a bit more to consider growing them, growing them in a pot, but it, yeah, it does look quite good, but you need a good support framework. And that was, we were fortunate enough to have that fabricated on site um, rather than having to buy in. And fan trained trees have been in a very, useful and I think often not used perhaps enough for apples and pears where they will work very well they're often used for stone fruits and most fruits you can actually use fan train trees but not as much perhaps for the apples and pears and here with a pear this is very hardy um, trained as a fan and these one of the old, older fans we've got this this one I think of Ashmead's kernel um, this uh, has got a lot of stems coming from the base of the tree. And you can see that's quite complicated to do because it would have made several cuts early on in the um, development of the tree. Whereas um, often with a fan train tree, you do one cut, then you divide, have one branch on either side, then prune that and subdivide, usually leaving the center 
without a major branch because otherwise that will dominate. But with this tree and with some, several of the others, they were started with a number of stems from near the base. And you can see it perhaps better with this pear, Gorum. So a lot of branches all together from near the base, um, which would have required several cuts over a, two or three years probably to, to achieve that. Um, I can claim no credit, it's about the same age as me, this tree, but um, it um, was trained by, probably by George Gilbert, who was a, a fruit officer at that time at Wisley. And also I know advised quite a bit with Heligan in his later years. But uh, yeah, very good to get to achieve that. But you can see there that again, the, it had some winter pruning spurs thin, so it hasn't become too crowded. Yeah, and we did seek inspiration from Garspeak. So I've uh, been there as well as Potage at Versailles and you know different places. And yeah, they do look really good. I think this might be the same trees we saw earlier. Um, and that led us to consider some others, but some of these I'm showing now are at West Dean. So, yeah, so some very nice forms. But this this one, this shot I took um, last summer at our garden at Bridgewater, the RHS garden at Bridgewater, where there's a lot of new trees going in. And if you can see on there, I don't think the wires show up very well um, against the brick, perhaps in that photograph, but the wires have been trained at angles rather than have horizontal wires and then things attached to them. The wires have been trained diagonally for this Belgian fence system. So uh, that should work very well. I did spend some time doing some training and tying of those. I think it was one of the hottest days of the year in July, actually, which is a, not a, you know, an interesting time to be on a south facing wall like that, but it was, you know, fascinating doing that. So there'll be more of those to see. And I can't comment too much on the work on the walls, but I know there's a lot of um, repairs and stabilization to the walls before the training, tree training took place. So the, some have been partly rebuilt and some sort of supported. And um, Andy earlier said he liked um, our cures. So do I. These aren't quite so formal, but these are the our cures that we created at Wisley in part of a trained tree garden, which is now about 12 years old, I think. Um, so, yeah, we've got our cures there, some W cordons and some also some uh, trees that I refer to as double diamonds. I'm not sure if that's actually their training, training and method. It's... Uh, I think it's more the name of a 1970s beer, but um, it, uh, it's another good method you'll see just in the background there. But the RQ is I particularly like because it's following the sort of natural curves rather than tying in quite so formally. These again would be some are pruned in the same way. And some of the uh, freestanding forms. We don't have many of these at Wisley. We do have a a winged pyramid, but these are at uh, West Dean. And of course, you also get quite a lot of very old trees and they can still look really good. Some, if they've been regularly pruned, um, don't need much restoration. Like those at the Potage at Versailles where they've been regularly pruned are great, but some you find would need, in gardens you find some that need um, restoration and that can be done in the dormant season. Thinning out and shortening spur systems, sometimes branches have started to grow out, but often that may need spreading over two to three years rather than um, trying to tackle it in one year, which will stimulate too much growth. And with many of them, the top tiers of espaliers can dominate and the lower tiers die out. If all the lower tiers are gone, then you can't do much, too much to it. But sometimes it can be necessary to remove the top tier to re reinvigorate the lower tiers. By taking it off, it, you should get energy back into the lower tiers. Then you can start a new top tier after that, because almost certainly you'll get uh, the growth to um, do that. And that's one with the top tier, not too dominant, but a bit you can see how there's more vigor going into the top. That's actually not one that I've been to personally. But that's at Anglesey Abbey. 
a very nice espalier, but you can see where the lower tiers are sort of not growing as vigorously as the top part of the tree. And this is somewhere I have been to, which I think is fascinating, which is Cannon Hall in um, Yorkshire, near to Barnsley, which has got many, many fine old pear trees on the walls in various different forms originally, I think. And they have been maintained. Often, wall gardens have often lost some of these very old trees. And it is one place that has got a lot of them. So here with a big espalier, some missing arms here and there, but still, I think, you know, a lovely tree to have. And there are a couple of other forms at Cannon Hall growing up the walls. All, almost all pear trees within the walls, I think, very few apples. I think they must have grown the apples outside. They were particularly in, interested in the pear growing at that time. And uh, this is uh, using cordons over an archway and with espaliers to the side. And this is with the, at the RHS garden at uh, Rosemore in Devon. So in the Southwest, it does have a couple of walls which are useful, particularly in the wet climate there because that bit of extra warmth helps dry out the leaves and you know, generally improve them there. And also this gives a, gives a good view out into the orchard beyond. If you look to that now, there's also a new newer orchard of Devon apples, which isn't there in this shot. And then the rootstocks, I could mention the rootstocks you might use. Obviously with the older trees, you get to use whatever they've um, they used in the past. But with apples, many of the rootstocks we would use the very dwarfing M27 is only really used for um, perhaps the step overs, the horizontal cordons, where it's very useful because it doesn't give too much vigor. M9 could be used for uh, step overs, but also cordons and some other forms. Then M26, which is a bit more vigorous. And then MM106 is often used for espaliers, as can be M116. That one is a newer rootstock. It's uh, reputed to have some tolerance of wet conditions and tolerance of or resistance to phytophthora, so it can be useful for heavier soils. It's probably about the same vigor as MM106. With rootstocks, it takes some many years to work out exactly whether they're the same vigor. That's why um, I say probably, because some reports say it's more vigorous and some reports say less vigorous, so you can probably assume it's similar. And then MM111, a bit more vigorous that you could use for perhaps bigger espaliers, multi-tier espaliers. And I mentioned the t those espaliers there with several tiers. The, the most tiers I've seen on the espalier was 22. And that was up the end wall of a Victorian country house. Um, I went there to suggest how to prune it. Um, it was fairly straightforward to point out how to prune it. It was just the getting up there, which would be the issue, but I think much easier with hydraulic platforms than it would have been with a ladder in the past. Um, so you can have many tiers and then you would need more vigorous rootstocks if you're going to do that. <coughs> so for 22, you'd probably need um, <coughs> M25 rootstock. And pears, um, yeah, quince C, perhaps for, if you're going to do the horizontal cordons and also some of the uh, other cordons, bleak cordons. And quinceline is a newer rootstock, which is probably a better alternative to quince C. Quince A, a bit more vigorous, used quite often for the uh, espaliers and, and fans. And if you want a sort of slightly bigger um, espalier, perhaps on a higher wall, pyrodwarf is good. The dwarf bit is misleading because it's dwarf for a pyrus, but it's still more vigorous than the quince root stocks. So it's fairly vigorous, but quite good. And you know that can be a problem, can be useful. I mean, if it's a, if you had a problem perhaps with um, trees not growing vigorously enough, which can sometimes happen, so that might be a good good um, choice. And with pears, it's compatible with all of them. So it's not, uh, you don't need an in interstock that you need with some pears growing on quince root stocks. 
but yeah we do have a good range of rootstocks now which i think makes the choice of um you know what to use for different trees better than it probably was in the past where the the, tw the choice wasn't as good so certainly um you know a lot of different forms you can try and i think it's really good trying different forms and you know see how they work out thank you so thank you very much jim um if you could stop uh screen sharing uh we'll have a look at some of the questions that have come in um one of them i think you've already answered actually uh lucy hart wanted to know what rootstock are your step overs on if i remember rightly was that 27 27 with the ones we've we've done recently yeah 27 or 9 really wow. but 27's good yeah okay um and then another one was actually um from joe lofthouse this is talking about an apple orchard um rather than trained um fruit trees they're wanting to grow them as half standards um so they've planted one year maidens pruned them back to 75 centimetres, looking at growing them as half standards. Would you recommend nicking the top three buds to encourage wider angles? Uh, that's a good question. And and I must apologise to Joe for not having a shot from Harlow Carr. But um, <laughs> um, yeah, you, you can, I would sometimes nick the top bud. So it, not always all of them, but the top one can often grow quite vertically when you cut a tree back at whatever height you cut it back so by just nicking just um below it about now um so late winter early spring to slow up the top bud the others would probably grow out at wide enough angles perhaps if you know it's a variety that's going to have very tight angles and very upright you might nick more than one but usually the top one Right. OK, now uh, we actually haven't got that many questions. And, and I do wonder, because having seen how most of our listeners or um, participants are coming from Scandinavia, whether they're feeling that the topics that we're covering are too specific to the UK and France, it'd be very interesting if any of our Swedish or Norwegian um, participants have some questions about working in the much more northern climate um, so I'm just putting that out there if you do have any comments and Hervé's got his hand up there um, Hervé do you want to unmute yourself yes uh, yeah I think what we have to say to the north country people is it's not a question of climate I think uh, I think it's more a question of a of uh, making trees who are close to people. Uh, I mean, all this knowledge and historical things that we have seen, and all this knowledge who seems to be very difficult to, to get is one thing, it's true. But if you, if you get to understand that uh, all this is also to make things easier in a little garden, to have little trees who give a few pieces of fruit instead of a huge tree who take all your garden. I mean, it makes people understand also uh, how interesting to grow little trees on slow rootstock. You know, I, I think this is a base of thing that when people understand, I mean, they, they have trees out there uh, near them at this size and things who are finally not that difficult to do, you know. Seeing from the historic part, when you know it takes you 50 years to make a, a seven branch uh, horizontal cordon, you know, you know also that it takes three years to make a vertical cordon on a slow root stock who give you fruit in a little space in three years, you know? So this is how you can get people to, to be interesting in this subject. Yeah, that's really interesting. And you're gonna be speaking after lunch about how to introduce these skills to non-professionals, which is really important. 
Um, and it is interesting because we have been talking about grand, great gardens generally this morning. But as you say, all these techniques are transferable to a domestic space. And in fact, um, I went out during coffee break to see that my two espaliered pears are, are just coming into blossom. And unfortunately, the sparrows are looking very interested in these nice juicy buds. So I shall go and flap about, I think, and try and keep them off because the, the problems are exactly the same, aren't they? Whatever scale you're working at. Um, so does anyone else have any knowledge or experience of working further north? We had some wonderful Scottish gardens, Susan, that you showed us. Clearly in Scotland, um, they had no qualms uh, growing quite exotic fruit. Um, and it's the same uh, latitude as some of our um, Scandinavian gardens. Um, I think... Yes, the Scottish gardens are inevitably walled, um, which helps. Uh, they, they wouldn't dream of growing anything without a wall. Uh, Interesting. And, and then there is a kind of tradition, whether it's true or not, I don't know, is that Scottish gardeners are the best gardeners. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Scottish gardeners are better than English gardeners. Um, of course. Again, I've, no, no real reason for this, but it's 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 one of the things that's always said. Um, and I'm I I did realise as I was getting my talk together that an awful lot of examples that I was giving were coming from Scotland. Um, I don't know if that's just a coincidence, but it it, it is it is very northern, um, and as as Similar to Denmark anyway, isn't it? Absolutely. So we have we've had a, a question from Pamela. Um, and I think this is, could be for Jim, because uh, we haven't really talked about grafting yet. Could you describe how to graft onto bare side branches to create new ones? So that's when your side, your horizontals have presumably slowed right down. Is grafting a technique you can use or would you perhaps use budding or, or nicking even? Yes, you can, you can graft if you've, if you've say missing a, a, a tear. I mean, it's far, that's if a branch is gone. I, if you're developing a tree, I'd, I'd sooner cut back again and, and start again than go on up and then have to try and graft but you you can graft they're actually not always techniques that um i've used but you can use peg grafts for instance where you would drill into the for a fairly thick branch thick main stem drill into it and put a, a graft into that so that's one of the methods where you actually use a slowly moving drill not too fast because you don't want to scorch it but um and then you do the do the graft as a peg just tapped into that and that can work um, I've seen that having been done but I haven't haven't done that myself I do grafting and in fact um, this week at Rosemore uh, on Thursday but uh, with a grafting masterclass but that's not one of the grafts I've I've done but you can yeah you can graft it into the main stem but if it's a young tree and you get and you only produces one branch on one side I would cut it back and start again but it's when you've gone past that with an older tree, you could certainly try grafts, peg grafts would probably be the one of the methods. And of course, one of the tricks that we saw in one of the slides earlier is to graft in different varieties into the same tree, which is quite an interesting thing to see, um, but um, has its risks as well um, with different vigour of, of different varieties. Okay, so yeah, I'm just going to say with the grafts, I think, yeah, with the different figure, you've got to regard it as a bit of fun if you're grafting in more variety, different varieties onto one tree. Uh, and yeah, there may be different figures. So I used to be a bit serious about it because some will dominate the others. And, you know, it takes a lot of balancing, but you've got to think, think of it as a bit of fun. So Andy, you had your hand up just now. You have to unmute yourself. Hello again. I was just going back to the original, the last question of the, the latitude of being north. Um, if we consider the inevitable of the global warming, you know, everything's going to move north, you know, in the south, I'd say we probably struggle with it being too wet and too warm now. So 
<clears throat> as the world gets warmer, you move north and you probably have more ideal scenarios. Um, and also, I think where we're, we're warming up down south, um, aphids and pests uh, are overwintering better, whereas up in Scotland or places like that, they get a good harsh winter and they knock back those populations. So I don't think there's anything stopping the people up north um, from growing the, the hardier fruit trees. And I think they probably in some ways find it easier because one of our biggest problems is fungus and disease and 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 bugs so that those colder climates are probably more suited to the trees that do um survive in that that that's a really interesting point andy and, and something that we do want to address um in the practical workshop is the differences um that climate change are creating in the way we look after our fruit trees um, and we're going to do, during the lunch break, we're having a bit of a poll for people to answer about the times of year that they prune. Uh, and we might even get into this question of whether that's changed over time. Um, Hervé, you had your hand up about something. Yeah, a question about uh, how to, to get a new branch growing on an old tree if you have a branch missing. So, of course, you can graft, try to graft at a, at a place where you want uh, this branch, but you can also uh, look on this old branch if you have a, a wood eye somewhere and you make a cut after the wood, the wood uh, eye, and you might wake up this wood eye and make a new branch. So this is another way to, to, to wake up an eye to have a branch where you have one missing. Okay. Yeah, that, that's with notch, notching, as we would call it. I usually find the notching about a third successful. So if you want to get a branch, do about three. Okay. Um, and hopefully one of them will work, but yeah. And, and Jim, I'd say possibly that you have been in this um, industry for perhaps uh, in practical terms, the longest out of all of us here. Would you say that you've seen climate change affecting how you, the timing of your pruning? Yeah, it, it does. It's, it's also, um, certainly with summer pruning, it does. It's, it's these wet, wet later summers that we've been getting recently has been throwing things out so that you have to prune later than you would have done and then you don't get the benefit of getting fruit buds on the, on the bit that you've pruned so you know were we to prune in late july or sometimes even early august now we just get lots of regrowth so we have to prune later it's not every year actually and i think with a lot of these seasons they're thrown about a lot so sometimes we get a late start or an earlier start we've had cold weather in the spring causing more frost damage as well that we had that we probably used to get so yeah it has it has changed and i think it makes the timing more difficult but it's always it stresses the importance to do it on the growth stage not on the calendar yes L look at look at the growth not you know not not just see what date it is so yeah yeah so um, we have suddenly got quite a lot more comments from Scandinavia just coming in um, and um, they're talking this is Jan uh, talking about uh, walled gardens with wooden fences were quite common in the 18th century in Norway and then the trained fruit trees came along with that um, even though we could have a lot to win on sheltering um, well no I don't quite understand that um, Yes, different varieties of fruit could, that could be grown in colder climates were developed in, in Norway. So they'll have a whole different set there. But also the glass houses where the fruits were grown um, with tender fruits. And actually, that's a topic that we're getting into after lunch because we've got the Chatsworth team talking about the amazing glass house growing. Uh, so that would be good for to compare perhaps different techniques in, in Scandinavia and here. And then a practical question from Francisca. Um, we find that the slow growing um, rootstock M9 for apples is difficult to establish in the north. Is it possible to train apple, tree, apple trees on A2? Now that's a different, um, ah, Hervé, are you aware of A2 as a rootstock? No, but uh, there is a M M twenty six also, which is uh, a, 
another slow uh, rootstock, and he has the advantage also to to be less good for those little uh, rats who go under the the tree and eat all the roots. I I don't know the name of this rat in English. Voles, I think. Yes. Yeah. So so we have this problem with the M9. Um, so we we try to to know use other ones, but and there is also the M7 I heard about, but I don't know this one. So, but I think M9 is is one of the easiest and best uh, rootstock to make to make uh, uh, slow trees. What I've been doing is to to, to be able to manage these these ones outside of the animals who eat the roots and everything, it's grow the first year in a, in a pot. Because in a pot, uh, I mean, the, the root system is very small and you can grow those for the two first year in a pot and then they, they get bigger and, and they, they grow better. And then when they're big enough, you put them in the ground. But I think it's, it's amazing how you can have apples we had five apples on the just after the first year of graft on one of those trees, and we were really amazed. Yeah, so. Jim, you had something to say there. Yeah, yeah. With the M9, it's not always as good for some parts of northern and western UK. Actually, um, M26, yeah, is, is a bit more vigorous than M9, but probably more re reliable for for more difficult situations. M7 is actually about the vigour of MM106. I don't think you can get it much now, but our orchard at Wisley, a lot of the trees were on M7, planted in 1949 and 1950. One of the downsides of it is it suckers badly, so you're always cutting suckers away with M7. But it's yes. used, in the, used in the States still because it's got better winter hardiness than MM106. Great. But I probably wouldn't recommend it, actually, but its, but it's merits are winter, winter hardiness. Um, but yeah, it does sucker quite a bit. But M26, yeah, is quite useful instead of M9 in some situations. Good. Right. So welcome back, everybody, um, to the Craft Skills for Garden Conservation webinar, the third one of this, um, well, our first season, really, of the winter. We're going to be going into summer workshops starting in May. And this afternoon, we're carrying on with the topic of trained fruit. Uh, and we're going to have a presentation from Chatsworth Gardens. Now, this is a fantastic garden in Derbyshire, which is just, um, I don't know whether Mick would describe it as the north of England or Midlands. It depends really on your perspective. <laughs> Uh, but um, Mick and Ian are going to tell us about how the history of the gardens has had a lot of trained fruit in the past. It might have gone down a little, you were saying Mick earlier, but it's coming back up and they're going to focus on both indoor and outdoor trained fruit. So I wonder if you could Unmute yourself, Mick, and uh, then share your screen, and we'll see some fantastic images of Chatsworth Gardens. Thank you, Kate. Can you hear me okay? Yep, spot on. Please share, share screen. Wonderful. <clears throat> so, um, hi, thanks, Kate. Definitely the north of England, I would say. Uh, coming from the south of England, this is quite far north, so obviously has an influence on the um, the type of plants that we can grow in the gardens and the, and the type of fruit we certainly grow. But also what really influences our gardens particularly are the family. So um, currently Chatsworth is, is unusual in the respect that it has a family that still live here after 470 years. It's the same family continuum, but it's also a garden that's open to the public. So these are these are the current residents. This is the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire. They're the 17th generation of the Cavendish family to live at Chatsworth. And they've always been as a as a, a quite a wealthy, um, empowered British family. They've had um, always been the head of fashions and they've always had quite a lot of wealth in order to um, 
luster on 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 the gardens and they've been very keen on the gardens and landscape since this um since they took up residence in the late 15 not uh 40s so this is the uh, the original house uh, the original owner was a lady called bess of hardwick from a local farming family who knew the estate well she knew the climate very well um married very well and happened to purchase this this property around about so the house the gardens and the landscape we look after today is around about a thousand hectares but the actual entire estate is um, is close to twenty thousand hectares so it's quite a quite a big estate spread across the north of england she purchased this in 1540 with her with her husband and set about managing the landscape in a new way and what we what we can see from these pictures so i just put a highlighter pen on is uh, this is the original garden the ornamental section of it was very small in compared compared to the productive area so all of this area here is production garden and if we look at the lower picture you can see this was actually an orchard more than likely for raw fruit it was the Tudor period so there was coming out cooked fruit into raw fruit but also the um the production garden extended into this area which was a series of ponds <laughs> and other um vegetable and fruit produce if we then jump forward through the successive dukes and duchesses so this is from that was 1550 before um the upper picture is in the late 17th early 18th century um the first duke we can see in red an orchard an ornamental orchard the gardens were very formal the fish ponds from the original garden are still outside so there is still a big productive garden but there is an internalized fruit garden in in, um, in use, very ornamented. Um, however, as fashions changed, uh, we come forward to the 1730s, 1740s, and this was the start of the English landscape movement where they were starting to naturalize the garden space and do away with some of the working elements. The fruit garden has now been moved outside of the garden wall in this area in red. And by the time we get to the 1760s, so this is in a very short space of time, actually there is no productive garden in the landscape whatsoever nothing can be seen from the house but in fact we have records to show that at, at this time in the in the late 1750s early 1760s the estate produced 330,000 bricks which went into a walled garden 12 acres of about five and a half hectares um which was situated somewhere in uh well we know where it was it was about three quarters of a kilometer away from the house out of view we don't have any records however of what was inside how how they managed fruit but we assume or we can only assume that a family at this level of of the english establishment would have been leading the fashions on the produce that they were growing however what we do have is we step forward into the 19th century this is the um, sorry about that uh, 19th century so this is the sixth duke at this stage and his head gardener joseph paxton um 1820s 1826 he actually started at the house the records started to become more complete and this was this was a duke that had a lot of a lot of money and he was a bachelor so a lot of time to really focus his time on derbyshire and the estates and he built this section of uh of the house which was twice the size of the original mansion purely for entertaining so at that point we have a lot of records to suggest that he was needing a lot of food and a lot of produce and had a big team of gardeners in order to be able to produce it so this is this is the wall garden that i talked about with the three hundred and thirty thousand bricks but this is a photograph from the victorian period we don't know if these internal walls were part of the original garden or part of this new garden with the sixth duke and joseph paxton as head but what we can see is that um greenhouse technology was being exploited to its best um so it, they had a lot of money and paxton was quite an engineer so there was over 20 um houses for primarily for fruit in this um in this garden although this 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 was a lily lily pond which we may talk about later on but these internal walls you can see that they'd already started to have and and if we think about size probably 17 15 to 17 foot sort of high walls 
train fruit being or the walls being used for for train fruit definitely and we know from other records that they were feeding and entertaining many 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 people in fact there was a uh, 80,000 visitors to Chatsworth a year during that period so so a lot of people coming through and then rather than um, all of the productive areas been having been removed by Capability Brown and, and Fourth Duke outside of the gardens Paxton and the Sixth Duke started to bring some of these productive areas back inside the gardens so this is an image of um, of a Victorian greenhouse built in 1840 finished in 1850 actually because originally it was a covered walkway with a heated back wall for growing tender fruits against um the windows the glazed areas were put in 1850 because of our harsh winters were starting to damage the fruits from they originally had canvas coverings um so so this is this is original although it's a heavy maintenance bill we, we do replace a lot of this annually but this is an original Victorian structure that's still in the gardens today. And we we manage it in a similar way. So we use the wall for growing um, tender fruits on primarily G, um, from the genus Prunus. But Ian will talk more about that in a second. So Paxton and Six Street brings um, fruit production into back into the gardens. With also a wonderful other collection of plants and greenhouse technologies. This was a, an acre. Um, greenhouse that he built called the Great Conservatory, which was world leading in its day and using modern technology of large glass panes and bridge and furrow um, um, construction in order to get maximum penetration of light to the inside of the glass house with very limited internal supports. And so they could grow a, a, a range of plants that were being collected from all around the world, including for us one of our, it's not a, it's not a trained fruit, but it's a really important fruit for Chatsworth, which was the dwarf Cavendish banana. And this is where Joseph Paxton managed to get it to flower and fruit and got his silver medal from the RHS. So we still think of fruit and the way that we manage the gardens today being sent around some of these historical events. And then unfortunately, and I think this is this this sort of represents some of the, some of the way fruit decline happened. Um, in the first First World War, um, there was a limit in manpower and coal, and heat in a greenhouse became very expensive. And so in the early 1920s, Paxton's great achievement with this glass house was, was demolished. And with it, um, you know, a big legacy, but also it was the start of the family, the Cavendish family, changing Derbyshire as being their main residence to smaller residences uh, in and around London. And consequently, the need to grow fruits and vegetables in this area declined too. So we had very little from this sort of 100 year ago period, we had very little in the gardens in terms of old ancient train fruit until now, actually. So this is a, this is a Paxton construction <clears throat> originally built as an, an orchid house in 1834. It was one of three orchid houses. And about 100 years ago, so it's a similar sort of time, 1990 years ago actually a similar sort of time to the when the great conservatory was being demolished this small greenhouse was actually planted with with a vine and i'm going to hand over now to ian because ian's the lead gardener that manages this area and we'll give you a, a, a an introduction to how how we looks off uh, hi uh, okay so as uh, as mix um, just said this was an original paxton greenhouse and uh, the uh, once was the East India Orchid House. And these uh, orchids have obviously been uh, rehomed in different greenhouses. And for the last hundred years, it's been our vinery and uh, we grow a muscat of Alexander within it in two beds. Um, we've, we've got the greenhouse uh, divided into three sections. And the first, there's the first section, which is vinery, second section, which is vinery, and the third section, which is peach house. We also grow peaches in the case, uh, the conservative wall that uh, Mick mentioned earlier. Um, the vine itself is grown in raised beds, and these uh, supposedly are left from the orchid house. Um, supposedly they were full of water with boards on them and the orchids were on top of that, so creating humidity. Um, but um, these were filled with soil and the vine is growing out of that. It's not a completely ideal scenario. 
um, because it does um, lead to issues such as compaction, which also then leads to such issues as shanking of the grape. So we do have an, a few issues with that. So um, moving um, on to uh, a shot uh, within the greenhouse itself. And here is a shot uh, mid season showing the gro grapes beginning to fill out. Um, they've just uh, paused because they were stoning. Um, they don't really grow much as they're stoning, but uh, they've stoned now and they're just um, filling out. Okay, so um, this is a close up of the grapes and uh, jobs at this stage are regular watering and damping down, monitoring uh, pests and disease, for example, mildew, mealybug, red spider mite, and um, airflow is very important at this stage. Um, we've, we've got top air and side air on um, during the daytime. And that uh, helps as well with regard to diseases such as uh, mildew. I'm introducing predators at regular intervals, possibly every three to four weeks. Um, for example, Cryptolemus and Spidex, um, which we obtain from a company called Coppert. So um, now um, here, here is a shot um, that's um, from around the beginning of March time. This shows the end vinery ready to go. So back in December, the, the uh, vine was pruned um, to two buds. Obviously, when it was dormant, we induced dormancy by um, letting the frost in. Um, so the next job after it's pruned is um, vine scraping, which is a very tedious job indeed, which takes seven or eight uh, weeks in order to do so with uh, myself and my colleague and um, volunteers as well. And um, essentially all the loose bark is um, scraped off the every inch of the vine. And um, this is because you get such pests as mealybug and uh, red spider mite underneath uh, eggs, etc. And once this is done, we, we paint the entire vine with SB plant invigorator, which uh, hopefully knocks off um, some of the pests as well. Um, soil change is done at this point where we take um, eight wheelbarrows of soil off and then put uh, eight wheelbarrows back on. And uh, we're using a sort of like a John Innes uh, number three mix to which uh, I add a barrow of leaf mold and uh, half a sack of uh, charcoal, dried blood, seaweed and osmocote. And um, so, um, at that at this point as well, once that's done, we start on the raffia work, and um, and um, raffia um, is, comes right up, and um, and we can uh, you, we can um, attach all of the shoots to this and everything. The heat is um, put on in the end vinery on the first of March, but um, I have actually done it a week later this year and might well do so every year from now on, because I'm trying to, uh, to make the crop a little bit later as well, especially with the uh, grape show being in October, which is quite a, a long way. Um, with the uh, middle vinery, um, I'd be switching it on a month later. Um, so um, soon, soon after it's been switched on, um, probably three weeks later, um, you get epicormic growth on all of the spurs, um, masses and masses of growth. And so we reduce this to um, three growths per spur, choosing obviously the best flowers. If there's no flowers at all, we'd, we, you still have to have some uh, shoots and we can use those for, um, uh, you, you know, to, to block the sun, etc. And um, so uh, once, once that, once, um, that's done and everything, we would um, stop the um, shoots two leaves after the flower. And obviously all of the, the, the buds um, on the leaf axles would start to, to, to go once you've um, stopped it. And uh, we would remove any um, buds that are opposite the flower or below the flower. And, um, and so um, 
we would let the buds that we uh, the, the and the axles of the growth that we've left the two the two buds go and keep stopping those and so you have one leaf extensions coming off that and that hopefully pushes the the um, power of the uh, vine into the grapes um so the flowers will um will develop and um and on warm days we pollinate them really by shaking the rods that's um all that um you need to do and when the fr fruit is the size of a pea we'd actually um, get our scissors out and another tedious job um, is removing 40% of all of the fruit. And um, we, we're after about a pencil width in between fruit and, um, and essentially trying to create a heart-shaped um, bunch of grapes with shoulders. And we, we start off removing this, uh, the, the weaker fruit in growing, etc. cetera. So, um, if we if we go on to um, we'll we'll skip that video and go on to the show um, boards. And um, so this is um, for the RHS late autumn fruit and veg show um, at Hyde Hall in Essex, and um, and we have been doing this for a very very long time, and um, and we've got some good accolades. Um, um, prizes in the process of we don't just obviously enter the um, grapes but we enter a, a wealth of other fruit as well from the um, kitchen gardens but um, my, my remit is the grapes and so we do a, a matching pair and we do a single bunch and we always try to take an, an extra matching pair and an extra single bunch at least in case we have a calamity on the way over um, which we've never had yet. Um, we, we tie each one on before the journey onto the hooks and, um, and then we have it at 45 degrees in a box so that it can't slip. And, um, and so um, we, uh, we, we're looking again for symmetry, we're looking for size, heart shape of shoulders and um, density um, of the amount of berries in the bunch, uniformity of colour, these are all things that we're looking for and, uh, and hopefully, um, you know, it's always a bit of a tense time and everything and uh, we have some uh, quite, quite a bit of competition these days. So it's, it's very, very important to us to show and, um, and the Duke and Duchess are very interested in it. They picked and displayed and taken down to the um, show on the same day. When I say on the same day, the show is the next day, but we do all the prep in, in one day. So um, there I am, <laughs> not a very flattering photograph, uh, but um, showing the first prize on a single bunch. Obviously the, the matching pair is the one that is, the, is more difficult because trying to get a a, you know, two that look the same, that are of that quality is, is quite difficult. Okay, so um, we're just uh, moving on now. We're just uh, going to talk a, a little bit about peaches. And so um, top, top left is the case, which is a Paxton glasshouse, which uh, has got peaches, predominantly peaches in the top section and an apricot as well. Um, but um, um, and um, on the uh, right hand top, um, there's some winter silhouettes of the, um, the peaches as well. And the, these are after pruning. And um, so we prune about November time and um, we are taking, we're taking out um, the, the old wood that has, um, uh, that has flowered and fruited last year. And we're trying to, um, to put uh, the, the new wood on. And so we're, or as much of the older wood as we can possibly take out is, is, is taken out at that point. And um, so the varieties that we go, um, generally it's peregrine and, um, and the new one that we've introduced uh, not so long ago is champion. And uh, that's a, a really nice vigorous one, um, which uh, as I say, it was, it was, we're getting, Quite a bit of success with it. Um, these are all white peaches, um, 
for some reason, I'm not quite sure what Mick might be able to explain that to me, but um, we, we always um, grow white peaches and it's expected of us to produce white peaches. So um, the flowers are pollinated with a rabbit tail on cane. And, um, and uh, this, this is really because of the fact that under glass, there aren't many insects around at that point. Um, they're flowering now and they have been flowering for the last two weeks. And, um, and so it's an everyday job and uh, we try to pollinate it by, you know, around 11 o'clock or onwards because the temperatures pick up and, um, and we, we always consider that um, you get a better pollination if, if, the, if it's not too cold. So after pollination, the shoots are growing like mad and we do what's called fronting and backing um, where we're taking shoots out at front and back um, because, you know, if you're growing it as a fan on a wall or whatever, the, 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 the back shoots are growing towards the glass and the front shoots are, are just going away. So we, we don't want those. And, uh, and then we would um, reduce um, the shoots further to three to five shoots, depending on the size of the stem. Um, as the fruit grows, we avoid uh, clusters of fruit if we can possibly help that. And as the peaches ripen, um, we, we stop watering because it does make them fall. And so, so that's um, just about all I have to say. Um, and I'll pass you back on to Nick. Okay, so so just, we're just going to move on. Kate, am I OK for a couple of minutes time-wise? You are doing very well. Yes, I think a couple of minutes should be perfect. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of I'll race through this section. So what we really wanted to show there is we do look after some fruit that's that's highly valued by the family still, and, and the fact that it goes to shows and wins awards is a and it's a, it's um it's been well looked after for centuries. It's not only part of our heritage, but it's also a great way of training gardeners. Um, it's a great way of adding an, an extra layer to the story of our heritage as well. Um, but that's 50% of Ian's working year. So in terms of the cost, it's it's phenomenal. And if you then take into account how much it costs to heat the greenhouses and how much it costs to look after the fabric of a Victorian greenhouse, for 500 bunches of grapes and a few hundred peaches, it almost seems questionable whether we whether we should be doing it or not. But I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I just wanted to come on to other areas of production. So the team that we work with, are the, the production team, we look after not only the indoor spaces, but outdoor spaces as well. And in 1994, to add to the Paxton glass houses for fruit growing in the gardens, um, the late Duke and Duchess, so this is this Duke's parents, built a three acre kitchen garden inside the walls of the, of the garden so this is very much part of the garden and um, with it had some old victorian glasses houses there but this was to grow fruit and veg and um, primarily for the visitor experience and what became quite apparent quite quickly is that two two elderly people can't eat the uh, the produce from a three acre garden um, and and the visitors started to question what do you do with all of that produce and so we had a series of uh, quite young but productive trained fruit trees um, that was were, were not only inexpensive in terms of looking after them, but actually to get people to pick the fruit and then do something with it was also a waste of results. So over, over time, um, some of the trained fruit in the kitchen garden started to drain for this reason. It wasn't getting used and it was expensive to look after. Luckily, the focus was kept on Ian's grapes and on peaches. Um, so we've got the glass houses. I just wanted to give you a, like, a few pictures so you can visually see what we're talking about in the gardens. This is what the, um, the kitchen garden produces now. And so there would have been a lot more trained fruit in there. There is still some trained fruit. We, we have apples, we have pears, we have figs, we have cherries, we have a whole series of currants. And like, as you would imagine, a, a stately home to have. But some of the um, some of the content, some of the more labour intensive content, has gone, and and it's um, even I suppose even more difficult to justify given that this this is the extent of the gardens, and where a massive amount of reduce uh, resource was going was this is the kitchen garden and these are the glass houses. So 
up until recently, a disproportionate amount of our work was being put into growing these fruits for no real purpose. And I think that changed and we, we've lost a lot of our trained fruit. And also we don't have walled spaces. So there seems to always be, you know, this this um, tension between should we should we be putting our efforts into that type of produce or not? And I suppose my role now currently is, uh, this is a, an, an example I like to use. So currently my role is to really look at this because keeping trained fruit is very much part of the garden's heritage. We think it's a really important skill set for all gardeners to acquire. There's very few jobs like this where you do get so intimately connected to the plants that you're working with. We think um, these, these fan cherries, which are about 40 years old, 30, 40 years old, are in a piece of the gardens that are not even open to the public. And so we're constant. Uh, to be honest, they produce cherries that are around about 25 pound or 30 euros per small box full. So if we were to look at that as a, um, as a monetary return, then there is a good reason to say we should start losing fruits like this. However, with the, um, the, the, the late Duke and Duchess, so this is the current Duke and Duchess, they're about to step down and their son and daughter-in-law are about to enter residence. They have a very different view. And their, their view is to how can we enrich the visiting experience? How can we make um, a bigger connection to, to not only our, our, our heritage, but our, to our horticultural past? And as a consequence, they're setting up these education centres and they want to start putting some of this historic fabric back into the garden, but only if we can justify the cost. So as I was saying, one of, one of my roles at the moment is to look at ways of using our produce to build um, a story, a narrative that, um, that enriches the visitor experience, that does bring back some commercial return. It can be valued as a way of training our volunteers and our, and our future gardeners and with that, I think there is a really good case now to start putting some more trained fruit, more um, exciting trained fruit, I think, back into the gardens. And so we're hoping to start planting in the next year or two a range of things that will be hopefully there for another 100 years like the grapes. So I'm just going to leave you with that. Uh, that's my final comment. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, and until we do, we've got some nice helpful fruits just to... Uh, to take the place of these lovely train versions. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Thanks very much, Mick, and thank you, Ian. Um, I love the idea of these massive, great utopiary fruits uh, replacing the real thing, but no, you're, <laughs> going, you're going to bring them back. They will be edible one day. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So it is a constant tussle, isn't it? Trying to justify the expense in terms of labour and heat, if you're talking about indoor fruit, yeah. um, against you know what the actual work value of the fruit is. And as you've said, it's a lot more than just buying a punnet of, of cherries, it's the visitor experience and it's the training of future gardeners that's at stake. So um, I think if you could stop sharing your screen, we're going to uh, go to Hervé now, who in some ways, I suppose you could say this, I don't want this to sound insulting Hervé, but you're the other extreme, aren't you? Where you're showing how fruit can be used for the whole community. Um, you don't have to be a duke or a duchess. <laughs> so you need to unmute yourself and find your presentation, uh, which um, hopefully we are, ah, here we go. Yes, uh, so I'm going to share my screen now. Is my screen shared not yet? Not yet. Okay. So are you going to introduce the project that you're working on? I'm sure you will, near Paris. Yes, yes. Yes. Right. So uh, let's get my thing away now. It is. It's here. Okay. We can see it behind you, in fact. But uh, we've. Can you can you see my screen now? No. Not yet. Okay. So. But we can see a lovely image, but it's your backdrop. <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen first. Okay. No, it's still nothing. Can you see my screen now? No. 
Oh, I've been doing it. Uh, go back to it. Here we go. Can you see it now? I can see your screen, but not your presentation. Yeah, it's coming. Ah, here we go. Okay. Is that all right? Not yet, no. You can't see my screen now? I can see your screen, but it looks okay. like some accounts or something. Yeah, it's like, okay, so I'm going to do this, escape. Um, I'm going to close this and close this. Okay, and now this should go. I don't understand why this is going. It worked perfectly yesterday, didn't it? It did, it did, yes. Uh, it's here. It, there think. it is at the bottom, yes. Okay, so it's coming here. Can you see it now? Yes, so we okay. just need the slideshow now. Okay. Is that it? Yeah, perfect. There we go. So we're on South of Paris, uh, South of Versailles, and uh, I'm going to, to show you uh, a project that we have started six years ago, exactly, which in the, this weekend will be an anniversary. Um, and uh, it, comes, it comes from, uh, from an idea of, uh, of uh, making an old orchard back to life. So, Everything in green in the screen that you see is what we have seen so far uh, with you in, in the topics you have been uh, showing. And I'm going to concentrate my, sh my, my presentation to community sitting and training people. I mean, you're going to see more people than trees in my presentation. So who I am, I am an architect and I've been working uh, uh, lately, as a state urban architect, after international uh, life uh, on big projects like Disneyland and other things like that. And the more I was growing in my life, the more I realized that architecture had a feeling and a meaning only if it was combined with, with landscape. That's why 15 years ago, during my work, uh, I went back to school and I did a landscape uh, diploma and a, a school of uh, trimming and growing fruit trees at Versailles, at uh, Potager du Roi de Versailles. And I have to name my two teachers, Jacques Becaleto uh, and uh, François Moulin. They were the two gardeners of uh, the Potager du Roi at Versailles, which is the biggest uh, orchard in France. So uh, they have been my teacher, they are my masters, and that, that they have really given to me uh, the, the, the willing to follow. And I'm retiring since uh, three years, but six years ago, I have started a, this project and uh, I'm going to show you how you can dream and, and start a project like this. So um, the, the meaning of this project, as I was, I was, uh, I know, I, I was knowing very well the area here and the and the valley. I knew there had been a lot of old orchard. So I wanted to try to get a land. This is the most difficult thing if you're not a private, if you're an association, is is to find a place and and make sure that the municipality is going to let you go. So, uh, especially if you're in a protected area, which was the case with 
the area of activity was a natural area, and we had to deal with a lot of uh, um, different uh, authority to get through. But uh, this is, the main thing was to do something together with citizens. You know, uh, I couldn't do anything alone. So there was two things to try to do is convince the municipality and the authority and to get people to, to, to understand the common visions that we had to, to, to redo this, uh, this orchard. So the local context um, in town was interesting because uh, this, this uh, town where we live in saint rémy les chevreuse was a village with a lot of orchard and uh, most of them disappeared through the years. And uh, in 2008, uh, we still had uh, Queen's trees in the middle of streets and uh, the, to build a, a, a bike trail. I mean, they had to cut those trees in the middle of the street just so the bikes could go through. And that was a shock for a lot of people here. And, you know, it's, uh, it's part of the uh, people uh, to react to the sort of action. And in 1980, uh, this old castle uh, in town uh, sold a part of his land to the town so they could develop a housing. And there was an association who, who fired the project. And finally, uh, after court and things like that, uh, this uh, housing project couldn't be done. So this orchard has been just lost uh, and, and left, uh, as you're going to see. So, um, all those facts make people here in town to understand why giving life to an old orchard which was abandoned had, had a real meaning. So this, this is a valley and you're going to, you know, all this valley was full of castle. There is one here, there is one here, there is one here, there is one here. And if you look this, uh, this uh, carte, this map of Cassini, which is drawn around uh, 17, 50, you can see all those castles. If you look close, this is our place. I mean, this is a Chateau de Vosgien. And if you look close here, you can see the water piece of the castle. And here, this is a sign of the orchard. You see all these little points in all maps. But you can see there is an orchard here, there is an orchard here, there is an orchard here. There is orchard everywhere. All the valley was full of fruits. Of course, people needed to eat. No supermarket at the time. So this is, uh, this is the orchard in 1969. I mean, the castle is, is here on the left, and you can see the orchard in 19 still cultivated. See the, the, the main alley, and it's 7,000 meters square. And you can see this green uh, square here is uh, what I, where I designed a project to try to sell it into to the municipality. So I wanted a bigger piece, but uh, they said, no, no, we don't know you. Uh, you have to show us what you're going to do. Let's start with 1,000 meters square. But let's look at the, the, what it was in, 1940, in uh, 2014. It was a forest because it had been abundant since 1980 uh, because it didn't belong to the castle anymore and it was not cultivated. So the so nature came back and it became a forest. So in 2015, I, we, it has been totally, uh, the tree has been, taking out. And in one year, it, it's just a, a field of a bramble in uh, 2015. And that's on this land that we had a hope to, to do uh, this orchard. So how to convince a municipality? Well, first thing is design. I mean, you have to make, we had a dream, but this dream had to be understood by the municipality. So I designed all the on this thousand meters square, an orchard with different form, different trees. Each each row was was drawn uh, at a scale to make them understand what we were hoping to do. So the challenge number one is is this, sorry. So, uh, well, it was to sell the project. So we had a few a few lay of administrative people in front of us because the land belonged to 
the Mary, but the area was a natural area which was on the top of the region. And the top of this the natural park was in charge to make sure that this area was uh, kept natural properly. So we had to deal with all those people to get through. So we finally draw a convention uh, with those people. And you see there is a region, there is a town, there is or association, there is a national park, the natural park. And all those people, are, we had meetings for hours and days and uh, we never signed this convention until May of uh, 2016, but I left the meetings in March and I said, we're going to plant in March. And next week, next Saturday, we are going to plant. And everybody looked at me and I left the room and yes, we did plant the Saturday after. So challenge number two, you don't plant 162 trees alone. So it was a challenge number two to find people. So we had a whole communication, you know, to ask all the people I was working with before a different association, you know, to get them to know the project and, and come to us. And this is uh, on the left, what the Mary put on her local uh, journal to tell people if you're interested, come. And on the right, this is all communication. And in the middle, it's the first communication of the town who was very happy to, to publish, to, to, you know, to, to show that this, this, uh, this uh, orchard came and has been planted. But this weekend, we had 50 people coming to plant the orchard. So we had a, manship, a membership system. People could join or not the association and each uh, membership had access to a library online which all the subjects about fruits they could see that that uh, they could uh, have all information about all the gardens so this is the first day we went to get all those uh, little trees that we had grafted in august 14 and uh, so those 160 trees were planted by volunteers we only had on this land the poles and some uh, of the lines uh, and the wire lines, but all the rest was uh, planted uh, because of this design that uh, we had to follow. So this is the day of the plantation. You know, people were coming, nobody knew anybody. I mean, uh, and just explanation, plants and things, everybody worked together. and some of those people were crying at the end of the day how you know how happy they were to have been participate of such a project you know so welcome to the inhabitant orchard of uh, yvette valley so we also communicate a lot in the forums in the local forums in 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 the shows there was a library show about trees so we had a place and this is the way we were communicate to people to to get people involved in this project what's amazing it's all the people who came didn't know anything about trees anything about garden trees you know but this is it you know i mean you know that uh, growing an orchard uh, like this i mean you need to build the structure of it it's 50% of the of the of the project i mean if you don't have a, a good structure you don't have a nice orchard so we teach i teach to everybody how to use this food how to use this why how to to hooks everything and uh, at the end we it took us at least one year to build all the structure of the of the of the orchard you know, so this is uh, people doing it. And, uh, and you can see on this photo here that this was the only old tree of the old, old, old orchard. You know, it was, of course, it was, it went, it went too far because it was not trimmed for years. And, uh, but the, the thing also was to invite families to have kids involved, to have kids looking for caterpillars. You know, the whole thing was around the trees, but a lot of other activity went with it. So this image in the middle is Francois Moulin, my master and teacher, 
who was so happy that I could at, or at my time give this uh, knowledge to other people. But every two, every time, two or three times a year, he came to the orchard and trimmed the trees with us and teach us things. And that's, that's one of the best days where everybody comes with 30 people on, a, on the orchard. So, so it's also, it became really a group of friends that uh, six months or one year before didn't know each other. And that's, that's the magic thing of the social, the social aspect of an orchard created and doing with a group of people. You know. So that's the orchard in, in winter all down, you know. You know that the orchard work is a whole year round work. So the orchard is open the Wednesday afternoon and the Sunday morning, which is good because the uh, orchard were not open to public, to volunteers on Sundays, you only have retired people, you know, but here having, having uh, it on Sunday morning, we had, we had very different people and a mix of young to older people with, with everybody bring what they knew about trees, if it, even if it was a lot, but everything was shared. So that's some image of the, the orchard during the season. So after winter comes springs and springs is a rootstock season. And so every year we buy like 300 uh, rootstock uh, and this is uh, shared to people and people either plant them in the house or since a few years we have nursery, the people nursery on the orchard. So they plant their rootstock on the orchard and we all together uh, graft those, those rootstocks, share the varieties. We have 250 varieties of fruits on this orchard. So everybody choose the, the fruits. And uh, so then we, we learn how to graft to people. So this is, uh, this is a grafting uh, uh, school, you know. Uh, you know, everybody try. And uh, I, have, I have a book where I write every graft done by who so everybody know that his graft is going to grow or not you know and this is different grafts uh, that we we did through the year i mean i'm not going to stay on those because uh, this is not a graft school this is a show to tell you how people work so this is graf à l'anglaise so that's the spring in the orchard so uh, the trimming uh, and pruning uh, season comes. So this is the main thing is how to learn someone who doesn't know how to do it. So this is, uh, I put around the tree, a group of people and they have to talk together and they don't cut anything until everybody agree what is what has to be cut. So the discussion, the sharing of intelligence of all those people makes that everybody is, is, uh, is learning and teaching to anybody. So after a few years, these trees try to, to come up with different forms, different, different, uh, different uh, systems. So uh, Odile, which is here, decided one day to, to invent a new thing. So she did not want to do uh, a new shape. So there we go for a new shape in summer to, to and we have put some pear trees on these. So of course, a lot of work also of cleaning and watering, and this is a, which make it a, a full year work, you know. So we are in a natural area. We have also this aspect of uh, watching insects. You know, we have been installing with blending wives. And so we have all this seasoning and observing of fruits. And of course, we always celebrate all those moments together, okay? It's, it's one of the main thing is to be together to celebrate together and to decide together what we're going to do next. We also, of course, do juice with the kids and different things. So, and then the press talk about it, you know, then you see in the, in the local journal that uh, the, the local patrimonial orchard grow, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it shows that it works and it shows that we want to do. So after, after two years, we have done the, the, the orchard on this thousand meter square in the left. And then we asked the Marie to get the 4,000 meter square on the right. And then we wanted to do something totally different and to create 
a new orchard which was much more free with a lot of uh, to realize each dreams person talking together and do it you know? so we have designed it we have been clearly clearing the area 4000 meters square to get all the roots away uh, and then we had this clean land ready to plant so we, we, we planted there only the trees that we have been grafted ourselves since two years on the nurseries and we also go to uh, do pruning in private gardens. People who have old gardens who don't know how to do it know that we have learned we can sell this service to private people or uh, we can also go to school and, and uh, plant trees with the kids. You know, this is something we do also. And uh, this is, well, this is a, a little celebration of... Uh, so what so what's I think some English people might know what it is. I discover it here. And after six years of uh, work, you know, all what you have seen so far is the beginning of the orchard. But no, the next photo you're going to see is what it is today. You know, the creation, clear creation of a pound, creation of wild picking area, you know, a hut with the boys, the boys are all these old boyfriends who decided to do a hut and so on. So to go, oh, and this is also, also the organization. I mean, everything, every time we come, there is, uh, I, I say what we have done and I said exactly who came to the orchard. And you can see here that since six years, we had nearly 6,000 people on the orchard coming to work, I mean, 6,000 time. There is around 100 people, uh, members of the association. And every year you have 40 people, 40% 40 of these people who go and 50 people of people who came. So which means there's new people every year. But what's interesting is out of 100 members, it's 30 people who really make the work on the site. I mean, when you deal with volunteers, you know, if you have 100 members, it's not because you have 100 people on the, on, on the, on the, on the land to work with. So it's very interesting to follow since three so exactly who came and how all this group of volunteers moved through the years. Oh, well, this is all the tree we have on today. I mean, we have nearly a thousand trees, you know, and different uh, with um, 400 rootstock and uh, probably uh, uh, 300 real trees growing with 250 different varieties. So this is, for example, a plan of one of the nursery. So each tree who has been grafted is written, the date and the people who has been drafting the tree uh, is written. So it's, it's really the history of what everybody did, which is, which is here. So this is the orchard today. You can see all these trees who have been grown. You can see how clean it is. And this is a 4,000 meter square uh, orchard that you have seen earlier, which was like a, a left, a left uh, ground. No, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's planted with uh, nearly 300 trees who are growing. You know, and this is amazing because when Jacques and us designed this new orchard on the left, I mean, the dream was that from the sky we could read a tree. And today that's what we have on the Google map uh, thing. So, which is, this is, so this is also another Jack, Jack ID. It's a, it, we, we, we kept a wild area, a wild pass uh, where people go and pick, uh, pick uh, wild fruits. And when it's hot in summer, people go here. We have meetings here. So this is all the maintenance going on and family coming, you know, uh, during the year. And this is new uh, grafting uh, uh, exercise. You see that kids want to learn how to graft. So parents come with the kids. And I can use, I can tell you that this little girl on the, on the left, uh, her, her graft grew and she, no, her father got a land in the middle of France on a farm and her, this little tree is going to grow over there. So this is picking, uh, of course, we have a lot of uh, gooseberry and blackberry and all, all sorts. So this is a, is a happiness of, uh, of picking fruits. 
Another idea was to have a pond, you know, natural area, trees, water, bees, you know, and there we go. We're just digging a pond. And also the oldest tree, the oldest wall on, on orchard was falling down. And one of the guys, Etienne, which, which was a, a, nursery, a, nurse, a nursery guy during the COVID, you know, he came to me and said, well, are they, you know, I want to redo this wall. And I said, well, as an architect, I wouldn't tell you to do this wall. It's, it's a huge job. But after 10 times he asked me, I said, okay, Etienne, you have a green light. You can go. You'll have 500 euro every year and go for it. And that's where we go. This wall is going to be finished uh, after this spring. And next winter, we're going to 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 grow new fruit new, new fruits here. So this is in the first orchard, so fruits. And this I, I, I added this photo because I wanted to show you to people this morning who were wondering uh, what the interest of having this tree. See on the left, these are the vertical uh, uh, vertical trees on M9 uh, rootstock. And you can see then on two meter high, you can have apples growing here and uh, it takes little place. It's at a human access and that's the most simple and things to do. You know, we were talking this morning also about, uh, about the rats. So those rats are voles, you know, and they are eating the roots of the trees uh, end of winter. So this is a damage uh, we go. So one of you guys said we have to plant garlic so those animals don't come. We did plant garlic, but they, they have been eating the roots. So this <laughs> they is- eat uh, the garlic, I'm sure. Hervé, we're running quite late. How much okay. more? Uh, I, I'm, I'm quickly done. This is a nursery job. This is of course the apple state tasting, you know, that this is uh, what we do. Uh, and this is a new wives that uh, we have seen this year. And this is a group of people trimming together. And this is a, a pruning that we go and do since three years in a chateau. Uh, we, we have been restoring the whole, the whole uh, orchard of this old chateau. And each time we go there, we're getting paid and that's the way we get money for you for our orchard. So uh, I want to tell you some words about uh, the, the way we're running this. We have a college of people which, which we don't have a president, right? It's a college of people who decide what we do. We always decide together. It's the youngest member is 13 years old. It's Matten. Matten. We have another kid who is 17, who is there all the time. You know, we're welcoming a lot of visitors. It's always open. We're making visits organized, you know, for, for other association. So, this, but you could read this because you will have it, is what everybody feels about it, you know. So we ask some people to say what they felt about coming. So you would maybe take time to, to read what all those people uh, liked, you know, to come. Anyway, so uh, we are a happy group of people. I mean, this orchard become a, really a social area where, where we have been uh, very happy all together to, to, to build this project. So now we're we call by other people to make orchard somewhere else. So it's difficult to to just duplicate a project somewhere else. I mean, a project of orchard is really something we built with the area, with the people, with the community, and it's, it's you can't just copy a project somewhere else. So um, it's it's important to understand that uh, each orchard is the baby of a contest. You can just copy something somewhere else. And this, what's magic about this, it's in six years, you know, it grows, it's nice. People come, people come back and, and it's growing because we have a lot of demand of, of helping other people to do it. So this is it, you know, uh, spring is here. <laughs> I, look, I look at these flowers. I think about all those European, Ukrainian flowers, Russian flowers in the orchard growing. And I really hope that the human uh, effect of orchard is going to help all of us to have a better world. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I just wanted to show you very quickly 
very quickly and just how how uh, how we trim together. So this is the people together, and you see there is groups of them and they talk. Yeah. That's you know, and the rules is don't ever cut if everybody is not is not. Uh, so I'm going to go quicker for you guys. Yep. <laughs> And we can see this, it's on the website as well, this film. Exactly. So people can have a look. That's absolutely fantastic, Hervé. So inspiring. Oh. Um, thank you so much. I can't believe how much you've <laughs> achieved in six years with very little budget. And uh, with, with, no, more, with no budget. Or well, no budget. Use. Okay, with volunteer help. It puts me certainly to shame, I think. So um, we have got a couple of questions, um, yeah. but mainly we're going to uh, just quickly, one question for Hervé. Did you have an irrigation system when you started so, up? To begin with, we, we had these water, water tanks of the castle nearby, and I wanted to do some solar system to get the water out, but the, the local authority said no. So we had a truck coming we, with one ton of water when we needed it for two years, we beginning like this. And then finally, we asked the mairie to have, to have a, a running water coming and we got uh, running water and now we have water. So, and now we have built this pond also who make us get the water who is here naturally. But uh, yes, we needed water, of course, uh, after two years for the big, for the big land. Excellent. And then there's a question for Ian, which I think I've answered in the Q&A, but perhaps we can just check I got it right. It was about the spray that you used on the grapevine after you'd done the scraping. What was it called? It was an SB plant invigorator. Right. And, uh, we would paint that on with a paintbrush, um, co covering all of the you know, other surface area of the vine. And um, you know, if it if it if you pr brush it onto something, uh, if you brush it onto a pest, it would uh, hopefully kill it off or eggs. But the problem is that they do inject their eggs into tiny little cracks and things, mm. so you will always have an issue and will need predators. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, with that whole uh, issue of biological control, we haven't had the chance to get into. That's for another day. So don't go, anybody, because we've got a third session, uh, which is where we actually get to talk to each other, because I'm very aware that there's an awful lot of experience here uh, that it would be lovely to share, not just by writing in questions or chat, but in these breakout rooms. So I'm probably going to mess this up now because I think we all um, will end this session. Is that right, Anastine? And then people will log back in again in the same way that they did, which is very dangerous because I'm terrified we're going to lose you all. You'll then go into groups, breakout rooms, uh, and we'll have a chance to discuss the um, the practical workshop but before we do that just thinking about it I think as we've got Gemma and Kelly here perhaps we should have their presentation now before we lose everyone so Gemma and Kelly uh, can you start sharing your screen um, and then we'll see the amazing place that we've got organized for our practical workshop which is Audley End and that's in the east part of England, um, not far from Cambridge. And it's a wonderful, I'm sure they're going to tell you a little bit. We've got to be quite quick, um, but here we go. Can you, yes, we can probably hear you too. Hello everyone, Hello. good afternoon. Yeah, we've literally just had an IT transformation on this computer, so we, we've timed it perfectly actually. If you can hear, hear us all. Um, so we'll keep it, keep it nice and brief. Um, so as Kelly's um, sharing the screen right now, just to give a, a little overview. So, um, so we work in a in a two and a half acre uh, Victorian wall garden, um, which was restored about 22 years ago. Um, so we work for English Heritage, uh, which are, which is a, a non-profit uh, charity organisation which cares for over 400 historic properties. Um, the wall garden itself, uh, we have about 120. Um, cultivars of apple, predominantly east of England. Um, we're a soil association certified garden. Um, we have been 
uh, you know, for about 20 years. So um, we worked on strictly organic lines, so no chemicals, pesticides, uh, working with natural systems uh, and biological control. Um, you can see actually towards the back area, we have two, two glass houses. We have a uh, nine, uh, we have an 1865 uh, example of a uh, orchard house by Thomas Rivers, uh, which is Teddy's pointing out, um, just in the middle there. Um, and at the back, we have a 1802 uh, historic vinery. Um, you can see in various sections, and we house uh, two black black Hamburg grapes, not as not as large as Hillary's at Hampton Court. Uh, and then we have a peach house in the far end tomato house uh, and a central show house which is currently under going under some historic renovations at the moment so that gives you a little brief overview um, we also uh, have the pleasure grounds um, and a landscape team as well and we are lucky enough to be a host garden for the PBGB scheme or historic and botanic uh, garden training program uh, so we host two two students throughout the year um, so that's on a on a rotation between between various teams. Uh, we have about 55 volunteers as well. Uh, and just a bit about going back to the kitchen gardens. So all our produce gets used uh, either on site or uh, an organic box scheme based in Cambridge, which we supply. Uh, a few photos here that Kelly's brought up. So just again, an example of one of our working areas. We have productive areas such as salad crops, uh, various rotational beds. You can see against our um, east facing walls, we've got cherries, which we have since taken out since that photograph as well. Um, various train forms, espaliers, fans, cordons, uh, stepovers, uh, all ideally within the county. So Hertfordshire, Essex, Suffolk, Norfolk, Cambridgeshire, some into Lincolnshire. Um, we also host an annual um, apple festival as well and again you can see Kelly and one of our other gardeners in the team preparing for that uh, we have various events throughout the year too again just another picture from that as well so yeah and every year we obviously are a progressive garden we we work with um, obviously you know we look to look to use period correct plants and cultivars uh, with our cropping plans um, we also want to obviously experiment so we have um, trial experimental borders uh, we work with um, Garden Organic as well, so we have a heritage seed library border as well. We're actually seed guardians uh, and we grow and save seed for them, um, and that's something that's essentially important for us to increase our uh, genetic diversity, adaptations to local varieties as well. Um, and again, another picture of, of our binary, so you can see some of the team uh, in there doing some, some winter maintenance. And again, you know, as, as, as Ian was saying from Chatsworth, it's, uh, and obviously Hillary as well, it's a uh, it's a year-long process in itself, uh, trying to keep that dreaded mealy bug at bay. Okay, there you go, like a nice, nice yeah. screenshot, gives you a bit of context there. Lovely, thank Lovely. you so much. So um, amazingly, you're going to let us, not quite loose, but we will be coming the last week of August um, to have a look at the garden and to try the late summer prune um, that we've been talking about um, and obviously see some of the indoor trained fruit as well. So that's a really lovely way of whetting our appetite. And as I said at the beginning, the, the link is open on the website for expressing interest in that workshop. So please do that.